Michael Witch, and I'm here at Fordham University, and it's April the 4th, and sitting next to me is a person I've heard about for some more than 20 years. This is Peggy Charon, who is the president, are you not, of Action for Children's Television? That's absolutely correct. Well, I got the first question right then. Right. Peggy, you're at Fordham here to talk about what specifically? Well, to talk about, I guess, my experiences with, with children's television, communications policy, and the unethical attitudes of most of the commercial broadcast industry. Is there some implication there for cable television in what you're talking about? Um, actually, not really, because what ACT has based its whole campaign on is the Communications Act that says in return for this license to use the broadcast spectrum, which is a public resource that you, uh, it's a finite resource, and we gave it away and we said in return for this gift you have to serve the public interest. We never did that with cable because cable isn't using that kind of a resource. It did its own wiring and got itself into our houses so that it operates under a different mandate. What we say is that Broadcasters serve adults much better than they serve children. They provide more choice and diversity, and that we treat children as uh, really the most um, unvalued audience in broadcasting, and our priorities should be just the other way around. I know that ACT got started up in Newton, Massachusetts, I guess in 1969, am I correct? Well, actually, it was the end of 68, but you're close enough. All right. But uh, you've now got a, a feather in your cap. I believe it was last, um, was November? October was October. Right. Tell us what happened in October. Well, in October, after 22 years of yapping about the need to give children better service with television, we got the children's television bill. You have to understand that what Act's been talking about low these many years is what's missing from children's television, not what's on. Most people who worry about kids and TV want to get rid of things they think aren't good for children, sex, violence, programs they don't like. Act feels that that's censorship and that the only way to talk about serving kids is to talk about what isn't there and hope we can train parents to turn it off more often when it's terrible. This bill does just that. It requires stations to serve the education and information needs of children with programs designed specifically to do that as a condition of license renewal. It took a long time, but it proves that perseverance wins in the end. So, broadcasters have now promised that they're going to produce special programming for children. That's the essence of the children's bill? Let's not get carried away. The broadcasters haven't really promised anything. Congress has said to the broadcasters, you better do this or watch out. We think the dynamic that's going to make it work is that the more than 60 major national organizations that help to make this happen, the pediatricians, the teachers, the uh, mainstream religious groups, um, or, uh, education and health organizations, they have more than 60 million members, just the ones that lined up with ACT at all our press conferences. We're going to educate all those people who are the audiences for stations across America to go to their stations and say, not take it off the air, we don't like it, but where is the stuff that our children are now entitled to? We think what's going to make it work is that broadcasters want to keep their communities happy, otherwise the community may not watch their news. That's why they send Bozo to the local hospital, that's why they part their Ankit's hair in the right place. And if they start getting a reputation in the community for uh, not paying attention to that community's children, we think it won't be healthy for the broadcaster, and maybe that's why they'll start paying attention to kids. That sounds like a lot of common sense, and the question I, I have is why t has it happened from the very beginning of broadcasting? One of the things I'm going to be talking about um, here today is the failure of self-regulation. Broadcasting is a competitive business, and with competition, you can't depend on the conscience of the broadcaster to do good any more than you can depend on the conscience of a chemical company to keep the bad stuff from coming out the chimney. You got to make rules to say you can't pollute the water, you can't pollute the air, and create that level playing field so the the all the players in whatever the industry game is uh, have to play under the same rules. It. Uh, it's necessary because otherwise the good guys will go bankrupt. They'll, everything they do will cost more money and they'll go bankrupt. And that's why we have regulatory agencies. That's why ACT went to the FCC. It was all working beautifully until Ronald Reagan got elected. Uh, and with his let him eat cable attitude toward children's television through his appointed officials, everything got destroyed that happened in the 70s through two Republican and one Democratic administration. So it was up to Congress to say, you have to be careful. You have to at least treat our children as, as well as you're treating um, our adults, because adults get much more choice than children in television. You could say we're pro-choice in children's TV. Mm -hmm. Does ACT have a vision of what 
uh, broadcast programs for children might look like? Well, I guess that um, if you if you go to the nonfiction shelves in a good children's library, there's a lot of um, openings for what's missing. We've been talking a long time about where's the news for children. We have lots of news for adults, particularly now with cable and that wonderful CNN, which all of us got addicted to recently. Um, there's there's no news for kids. C CBS in the 70s, when when FCC chairman was saying, hey, you got to take care of children, had in the news between the cartoons. Even that was better than nothing. Uh, there's a tremendous opportunity for moving in on, on what's missing. In fact, the station in Washington, WTTG, has just produced um, a news magazine called Not Just News. Uh, the general manager, Tom Hurwitz, took it to the broadcasting uh, meeting in New Orleans where they look at new programs to pick for the next year. And uh, he's selling it. In fact, all the Fox-owned um, and operated stations signed on to it, and I think uh, other stations are too. And the pitch that he was selling it with is, this program fulfills the mandate of the Children's Television Act. That's what Act's been trying to do for 20 years, create a market for people who want to make that kind of stuff anyway. Do you think that the cable television industry is going to take a, uh, a hint from what the broadcasters will hopefully start doing? I think the cable television business has been doing it anyway. I think that, um, that for people who can afford it, cable television provides a lot of alternatives that weren't there when ACT started. Um, the Discovery Channel uh, has a lot of information programming. Uh, the uh, Nickelodeon has kind of um, interesting and sometimes very glitzy programs for young children like, like Eureka's Castle and for, um, and for kids who are turning into teenagers. Um, Disney and um, HBO and Showtime have children's programs that are the kind of things you want to tape if your kids are at the dentist. But best of all, I guess, is public television because you can get that uh, sort of for free. Uh, you can get it even free of commercials, which is a very special advantage if you have children who've been badgering you to spend money, especially if you just lost your job, which a lot of us are doing these days. Have you seen programs made by children on public access channels? I think that public access is one of the neatest ways there is to teach children how to deal with television because we think making programming for kids, uh, having kids make programming for kids and even for adults is, um, is one way you learn to watch television. It's maybe job training, uh, it's, it's fun, and it helps, I think, to draw kids to television as something that says something to you instead of sells something to you. I think um, that the communities where cable access is working are very lucky, and Act's been pushing that kind of opportunity for a long time. Peggy Charon, I thank you very much for your time, and I think your audience here at Fordham University is waiting for you to talk. If we just listen to somebody who has made a difference, a big difference, uh, and a very meaningful difference um, in our industry, uh, in the subject matter that you're all studying, and uh, I suspect for many of us in our lives, Peggy Charon. I can always get a job. In my next life, I'm going to be tall. I, I, once, I once did the, I told somebody when they were fixing the mic, I did the Ted Koppel show. And because I was sitting between two tall men, I looked like the dormouse um, who was going to fall into his soup. Uh, and I said, I'm not going to do the show unless you find something to make me taller, to raise me up. So they found two phone books. And for the whole program, the two phone books were moving around. And I thought I was going to fall off the chair. Um, Anyway, I first want to start out with a big disclaimer. After listening um, to the introduction, you might think I'm responsible for Saturday morning. That is not true. Um, I, I worked for 22 years, and in spite of all the kudos I get, uh, you can see just how successful I was by turning on um, Saturday morning. That was not quite what I had in mind. Um, one of the first things I did when I started ACT um, in 68 was to call Everett Park. I had read about um, his fight for the rights of the public and particularly minorities in broadcasting and I decided that I needed his advice and um, I think that if I hadn't made that phone call I probably wouldn't be standing here today because he let us use his lawyer for nothing and without that I wouldn't have probably responded to the FCC when they said yes to our proposal to initiate a rulemaking and this whole thing would have died right there. 
Uh, also, as I, as I worked um, to get to know the people who, who worked in broadcasting, I met up with um, Don McGannon, the CEO of Westinghouse, and he um, made sure even before he met me that his uh, station group was serving children. Each one of Westinghouse's stations had a requirement to do local programs for children. So you can see why I'm delighted that Everett called me to come here today to give the Donald McGannon lecture. I feel that that's really the roots of ACT. In general, I'm, I'm responding a little bit to the, um, to the title of this lecture, which is the Donald McGannon Lecture on Communications Policy and Ethics. It must say something about how this country is working that this month I've been asked to give five speeches on ethics and kids' TV. The first time in 22 years anybody even mentioned the word ethics to me. Uh, you saw that, that um, the Harvard Business School maybe got one of its biggest grants for ethics. Um, everybody is, is getting a sense that we should start talking about ethics. I really don't think that ethics play a large part in what I've been doing or talking about. I think ethical behavior generally is caring behavior. And for the past 20, 20 years, I've been involved in questions about who cares about children's television. And the demographics of caring depend very much whether you're a parent or a government official or a corporate executive. Exactly who are you going to be caring about? And one reason we should care about what television is doing for children is that in the US, one in four preschoolers is poor, one in five is at risk of becoming a teen parent, one in seven is at risk of dropping out of school, one in two has a mother in the workforce, but only a small fraction of families have safe, affordable daycare. And although television can't feed or house our children, it can begin to break the cycle of poverty. I started ACT because I thought that TV was one of the most cost-effective education systems we have in this country. That's what CTW realized when it started Sesame Street as a Head Start program. There was no cheaper way to reach kids who needed to be taught so they could, they could start out on an equal basis with kids who had everything. It can help children to think, to imagine, to question, to create. It can introduce them to the stories of a Nancy the Spider. Did you ever see the, um, the video cassette with the stories of a Nancy? If you have any kids or grandchildren, you might look for it. We never see things like that on television, except on public broadcasting. It can teach them to value poetry and music. I mean, just think of a poem as a, as a spot between, uh, between programs, between children's programs, instead of a promotion not to touch the dial, but to stay tuned for the ninth half hour of, of even Ninja Turtles. Um, by the way, it, you know, Ninja Turtles is on five days a week in the afternoon, and I have nothing against turtles who live in the in the uh, sewer, and, and um, I sort of had this thing about pizza. Um, the, the kindergarten teachers have a fit because they keep bringing sticks to school, these children, and that's what they play in the, in the courtyard. But I do think that for a major network to decide five half hours a week wasn't enough, and on Saturday morning they're going to give them two more half hours back to back, was really a bit much. It's a question of choice and diversity. It's not you have to take it off the air because there's something wrong with it. But we give children so little choice in this country while we give us really a lot of different kinds of programs to watch. That's the, the major problem. The, the Committee for Economic Development said that the United States is creating a permanent underclass of young people who cannot hold jobs because they lack fundamental literacy skills and work habits. I really can't understand how corporate executives who in their meetings, when they all get together, talk about how much they need to work to improve education, if only so they can hire people who can read and write in their own companies. When they start to plan what to do for children on television, they come up with the kind of ideas that we see on the screen. Anyway, the most important thing I learned in 20 years of, of trying to make change is to distrust conventional wisdom, to question the findings of industry, of government, and even those of academics, she says very gently, uh, being in an academic institution. Anyway, I've collected some examples of dumb ideas that distort the debate on children's TV issues, and I want to share them with you today. 
dumb idea number one. What's good for CBS is good for children. That's the 1980s trickle-down theory of communications, and it was a disaster for kids' TV. Deregulation under, of broadcasting under Reagan seriously hurt children, damaged the industry's capacity to serve their needs. Um, you know, three-year-olds and seven-year-olds and 12-year-olds are very different. I mean, take the two to 12-year-old audience as a 10-year period, and you can't really program for that 10-year period, whereas 30, 40, and 50-year-olds can all like Murphy Brown. It's, that's the reason why the, the need to reach audiences doesn't work for kids. There aren't enough kids at any particular level. And it really is very tough to do a program that, um, that talks to children who are too young to cross the street alone and to children who can read Mad Magazine. Do they still make Mad Magazine? At least in, when my kids were young, they had Mad Magazine. Um, because they're so different. They're like three different animals, those three age groups. In the 70s, through two Republican and one Democratic administration, FCC chairman kept reminding the broadcasters they had to serve the public. And grant, but that was in part because ACT went, went to the FCC and we got a, a petition um, that became a rulemaking that lasted for 13 years, one of the longest rulemakings in the history of the commission. And in those days, uh, in part because um, Dick Wiley, who I think was here last year, and uh, Dean Birch, who was the chairman under uh, Nixon, and who had a five-year-old kid, and maybe even more importantly, used to go out with Joan Gans Cooney, who started the children's television workshop. You never know what influences people to act. Anyway, in those days, CBS had Captain Kangaroo, Monday through Friday. They had 20 people in their news department doing children's programs. They did In the News. Any of you remember In the News? Are you the right age? Between the cartoons? You know, you didn't turn it off because you knew it wasn't going to last very long. And um, they had a series of specials, what's an election all about, what's Congress all about, what's a bill all about. They had Razzmatazz, a news magazine. They had 30 minutes, a spinoff of 60 minutes. And it was all under Joel Heller, who's still there doing adult programming, because guess what happened when Reagan got elected? Those 20 people were fired or reassigned almost in one day, and all the programming was canceled. That's a perfect illustration of just how important what Washington says and does affects what we see on our screen. Uh, in the same way, when, um, when cigarette commercials went off the air, one of the reasons they went off is because the cigarette industry was so upset with the anti-cigarette commercials. You remember those things? You're going to die from emphysema. Those were the days when I smoked and I thought my children were going to kill me because they thought that they were going to lose me to cigarettes. They're very effective, those anti-cigarette spots. Well, when the cigarette commercials went off the air, the requirement to air those spots went away too. However, it didn't say, the law didn't say that you have to get rid of the anti-cigarette commercials. Cigarette smoking was still a problem and the industry could have aired almost as many of those anti-cigarette spots without the tobacco ads as they did with them. But as soon as they didn't have to, they stopped. Dumb idea number two. Sex and violence and Bart Simpson's t-shirts must be censored to protect children. Now, unfortunately, the broad audiences attack attracted to sex and violence include kids. And many parents and educators and lawmakers and conservatives and liberals, the conservatives want to do away with sex. Uh, the liberals want to do away with violence. Women's groups want to do away with violence against women. And they all end up wanting to censor television. The raunchy rock rhymes, you know that, that story, uh, dirty words, sexual innuendo, and even t-shirts act actually uh, organized a campaign to protect the t-shirts against those principals who don't understand about free speech. You know, if you have a problem with a shirt that says, um, what was it, um, I, I, an underachiever and proud of it. Can you imagine a principal wanting to ban a t-shirt that says underachiever and proud of it? Uh, you, you should have a meeting. I mean, you could have an assembly and say, gee, what, what about that? You know, how, there's all kinds of ways to deal with the idea that you think something is undermining uh, education. My feeling is I would have let it alone and, and treated it as a kind of, uh, you know, joke, the way kids have these dumb jokes. Uh, but that's not what we do. We are more likely to move in on speech than we are to create choice. I guess you could say ACT is pro-choice in programming. The FCC is more interested in stopping dirty words than they are in creating structure for change that will increase choice and diversity. And in a democracy, that's what's important. Um, ACT has the feeling that 
uh, that first of all, your hair doesn't feel out of, fall out if you do happen to hear a dirty word. And secondly, parents can use that off button more often, um, not just to protect children from terrible television, but to get it so maybe they're not watching it as often. You know, the average in this country is almost four hours a day of television for children, and that's really the major problem. In the days when I was growing up, you went to the movies, and it was three and a half hours a week. Very few kids could go twice in one week, not because you couldn't afford it, they were pretty cheap then, but because that wasn't the way we thought it was appropriate for kids to spend their time. Uh, certainly, the amount of time we spend with, with children's television, children anyway, is, um, is a major problem that is not the fault of the broadcasters, and we know we can blame it on single working parents and double working parents, but no matter how successful I am, or ACT is, or, um, or the FCC is, in getting more choice for kids on that screen, if we don't help them find those programs and turn it off more often, it won't really make much difference what's there. ACT recently took the FCC to court because of its um, attempt to organize a 24-hour ban on indecency. I must admit, even in Fordham University, that we are on the side of the dirty words. Uh, we think that it is not appropriate to, um, to have such peculiar channeling in order to protect children for two reasons. First of all, it makes people think that that is what children need from that screen. They need that kind of protection instead of focusing on what they really need, which is news and public affairs and the kind of programming that isn't there. And secondly, in a democracy, that's just a very peculiar way for the government to behave. And we think that when they make peculiar decisions like that, they should be challenged. I might add that the networks, People for the American Way, the American Newspaper Publishers Association, are all on ACT side of that one, and it looks like we're going to win. I went down and heard the oral argument on it, and the FCC um, attempt to, um, to, to say that we have to to not have dirty words, we have to not have indecency at two o'clock in the morning to protect children, cause the whole court to start laughing. Um, dumb idea number three, advertising to children is a public service. This dumb idea is promulgated by the American Association of Advertising Agencies and the other lobby lizards who walk the halls of Congress. But freedom to communicate messages with, with commercials depends on the existence of a free thinking independent audience. And children are particularly vulnerable in that respect. Instead of treating them very carefully, some of our worst advertising is targeted to kids. Um, the, um, we, we, we tell them to buy the things that people who care about children don't want them to have. We advertise 900 numbers to them. The most vulnerable children to those 900 number ads are latchkey children, children home alone after school, because the parents aren't there to say, hang up the phone already. Those are the kids who can least afford the $200 bills that sometimes happen before the parents know what hit them. Do you know there was a station, talk about ethical behavior, there was a station or, or an, a set of ads in Atlanta, uh, no, not Atlanta, in Seattle, in Seattle, Washington, which is supposed to be a really nice place to live, that told young children, if you don't remember the number, just bring the push button phone over to the set and we'll dial it for you, which you can do, you know, with the sound. I mean, just think about that. If you can't remember the number, I mean, what age child do they think they're talking to? The press got a hold of that one and it stopped because it was such a peculiar story. But I've come to believe that advertisers and even some broadcasters, certainly not the broadcasters sitting to my left, but some broadcasters will do almost anything to make a buck, no matter what effect it has on children. And why? Because our children represent a billion dollars a week in purchasing power. It's sort of hard to believe, but American children, four to 12, have six billion dollars to spend each year. 12 to 15 year olds, 10 billion, and adolescents, 40 billion on themselves and about 30 billion for family purchasing. Uh, there's the reason right there why we want to sell to children. Um, the, in the early 70s, drug companies put ads on kids' programs for vitamin pills. Do you remember them, Zestabs? Um, uh, the Flintstone Vitamins, was Hoffman LaRoche, Bristol Myers, and Miles Laboratories. Well, I thought that it really wasn't appropriate to sell pills to children. We went to the American Academy of Pediatrics and said, is this so necessary to get kids to swallow these things that we really shouldn't take the ads off the air? On the contrary, they said, Vitamin poisoning is the highest cause of poisoning for children under five. It puts kids in the hospital in coma and shock. 
and we bought a bottle of the kids' vitamins when we were filing at the Federal Trade Commission and discovered they said on the bottle, mandated by law, keep out of the reach of children. I mean, can you imagine? A third of the advertising to children in the early 70s was for a product that you had to put on the bottle, keep out of the reach of children, and we were selling it like candy. When we went to the NAB code, they said, Peggy, it isn't a problem. It's a food supplement, not a pill. Um, it, 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 it's little problems like this that caused me to get so nasty when the press calls, and I say these really, um, you know, sound bites, they call them. My husband told me if I keep talking in sound bites, he's going to get rid of me. Um, the, um, we, we knocked that problem, by the way. We filed at the Federal Trade Commission a five-inch thick petition the second time it happened with Hudson Pharmaceuticals, who gave Spider-Man to Electric Company to teach reading and then started pitching Spider-Man vitamins to children. And we got a consent order against Hudson that effectively stopped the advertising of vitamin pills to children. That was sort of, uh, that was one of our major victories. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen too often. Dumb idea number four. Although deceptive advertising to adults is illegal, it's okay to deceive children. When Seymour Banks, who was vice president of Leo Burnett, which is the ad agency, was defending advertising practices in a Washington Post interview, can, you won't believe what he said, and it's, I have it in print. He said, children, like everyone else, must learn the marketplace. Even if a child is deceived by an ad at age four, what harm is done? He will grow out of it. Even if, as many psychologists claim, a child perceives children in TV advertisements as friends and not actors selling them something, where's the harm? All a parent has to say is shut up or I'll belt you. I mean, can you imagine saying that to the Washington Post? I mean, you have to be off your rocket to talk like that to the Washington Post. Um, the, um, it, it, you know that, <laughs> I love this quote. I, I have to admit that most advertisers don't talk like this in public. Um, and uh, as Seymour heard that I sort of use it because it's such a nifty way of pointing up what I'm talking about. And he called me up once. He said, Peggy, I wish you'd stop saying that in public. And I said, Seymour, when you, try to, when you treat children nicely with commercials on television, I'll stop talking about you. So you can see I'm still using it. And just look at children's advertising, you'll see why. Um, in the 1980s, what deregulation meant is that we turned the programs into advertisements. It isn't enough to have them interrupted by 30-second spots. We decided that, um, that nobody would fuss if, uh, if we did a whole series based on a whole lot of toys because the FCC wasn't paying any attention to anything in the 80s. In 1969, the FCC said to Mattel and ABC, you can't do a program called Hot Wheels. They did that not because of me. I didn't even know it was happening. A complaint came from another toy company, uh, Tapa, which must have felt that it wasn't fair to have a 30-minute commercial of one toy company when they only had 30 seconds. It's significant that Tapa has since gone out of business. You can see what happens to you when you don't make 30-minute commercials. Um, in any case, in 1983, the FCC um, was not paying any attention, and there were eight programs, and ACT filed a complaint. And we thought we were going to win that, because after all, it was the FCC that said you shouldn't do it. But the FCC said we changed our mind. So by the 19, 7, 18, 1986, there were 70 shows on television that were based on toys produced in part by toy companies that were designed to sell product. Now, we're not concerned about that because kids will ask for the toys more often. I mean, you can always say no more often, I guess. What we're concerned about is that it keeps everything else off the air. It works so well for so many vested interests that producers were calling us up and saying they couldn't get a program on the air that didn't have its toy connected to it. The broadcaster liked it because, first of all, it was free up front. The toy company spent a lot of money on advertising, so the program benefited from that in terms of its audience, and the station could sell the other advertising minutes that they didn't give to the toy company for more money. Everybody made out except the kids. And it isn't just G.I. Joe. You can sort of see turning that toy into a war program. But what about a plastic necklace? Can you picture the board meeting at Hasbro when they said, you know, G.I. Joe is doing terrific in this plastic necklace. Charmkins isn't making out at all. So they turned Charmkins, a plastic necklace, into a TV series. I mean, it, it, it boggles the mind what they will dream up to do for children on television. Um, we are trying to do something about program length commercials, but I wouldn't bet a lot of money that we're going to knock that problem. It, it's, it's a difficult one to deal with. 
once the cat's out of the bag, so to speak, it's hard to stuff it back in, we do think that licensing is not the problem. Even though there's a billion dollars worth of stuff for The Simpsons, The Simpsons started as a program, it was popular, so there were licenses, and that's okay. It's not, it, nobody thinks that Sesame Street put Big Bird on the air in order to sell animals. Um, the program was there and then came the product and it's significant that none of that stuff on, on Sesame Street, none of the Sesame Street toys get sold to kids on television. If the broadcasters don't want to put into effect or the FCC doesn't want to put into effect Act's, Act's idea of what to do, about program length commercials, which is to let the program stay on the air for a year or two and then the products can come out if, if they're so inclined because then obviously the program is the reason for the product and not vice versa. They could also make a rule that maybe you can do it if you don't advertise the toy. You can make a toy of G.I. Joe and My Little Pony and Thundercats if you don't have any ads for it because then kids might not even know it's available, ho, ho, ho. You can imagine how likely that is to happen. Today, tobacco companies worried about all the adults who have given up cigarettes are targeting teenagers and children with images linking smoking and sports. You know, those, the Marlboro races with all, and the, all those games with all the posters, um, the Virginia Slims, tennis, and what ACT did was file and say that if the stations that are doing that should be required to bring back those anti-cigarette commercials. I don't expect um, that that's gonna happen immediately, but it's, it's a very First Amendment solution to that problem. Uh, because they're really violating the law that says you shouldn't have cigarette commercials on television. Uh, then there are all those hidden commercials, you know, the Marlboro truck in, in all the movies that kids like to watch. In 1989, cigarette smoking was shown in 83% of films that kids were likely to watch. Dumb idea number five. Let's sell advertisers to, the kids to advertisers to pay for educational deficits. I think the most dangerous example of our willingness to commercialize the world of childhood is Whittle Communications Channel One, which is a daily 10-minute newscast for schools interrupted by two minutes of commercials, four commercials uh, every for the 10 minutes. In return for guaranteeing that at least 92% of its students will watch these ads every day, the school that accepts the program receives free TV monitors for most of its classrooms. So what we're doing is selling kids for a mess of television sets. The 7,000 schools that have said yes to this Trojan horse of a deal are ignoring some basic educational, moral, and legal tenets. Learning works best when you feel good about yourself, and advertising works when a felt need is created that only a product will satisfy. And advertising in a classroom emphasizes economic differences. It's outrageous to tell kids to spend money when one in five American children lives below the poverty line. That's one reason why I'm so angry at Whittle and Time Warner, which owns some, I think, half of, of the company, for um, deciding this was an appropriate way to go. Um, but now I'm even angrier at the school officials who say yes, because Whittle is just a hustler. And after all, we sell tobacco in this country. We can, we can try to sell anything, but it's the responsible, responsibility of the people who are in charge of taking care of our children while they sit in schools mandated by our public education to go there. It's their responsibility to say no. And um, it's amazing to me to watch the schools that say yes, because we know why. I mean, they're poor and the, and the um, educational budgets are very tough now, particularly in rural and, and lower income communities. But what if a, a textbook manufacturer comes and says, hey, we're gonna give you free history books and there'll be an ad every 10 pages. Um, we, we're not ready, I think, to have our teachers do the commercials and that television set in the corner of the classroom is a teacher. We're gonna test the kids on the stuff in between the commercials. Whittle said on Channel One, Chris Whittle said, on, not, he said it on, on the Today Show about Channel One. He said, don't worry about the commercials. The kids will scratch their head and talk. During, you think that's what he says to the advertisers that are paying for all those TV sets? No. Um, anyway, we're, um, we're very pleased that CNN Newsroom, which is Ted Turner's CNN Network's alternative, commercial-free, free alternative, is in 18,000 schools, and, and that's climbing every day. We're working to help promote that as an alternative if you want news in the schools, TV news. And we feel that every one of those schools is at least one that said no to Whittle. Um, I hope that, um, that advertisers eventually will do away with that idiotic idea. I mean, I wouldn't even, you know, they have a thing where you, we, you go into pediatricians' offices with these things and doctors' offices. 
I wouldn't even want that for me. But there's something really sick about doing it in a classroom, telling kids they should get Nikes. I mean, $170 sneakers, when we read in the newspaper that kills, kids are killing each other for $170 sneakers, maybe we should make the schools responsible if that happens. You know, and soon. Dumb idea number six. The TV industry doesn't need rules, self-regulation works. This may be the major answer ACT has gotten in its 20 years of trying to make change. That public interest standard that's defined by only a few words in the Communications Act of 1934, that's the legislation that charges the FCC to license each broadcaster to operate in the public interest, convenience, and necessity. I never found out what convenience and necessity were all about, but I know that operating in the public interest cannot mean doing what we do to our children on commercial broadcasting because we just give them what worked last year. We give them more of the same. Uh, fortunately, we got rid of the, all those robot programs because there were so many of them that the kids divided up and the audience went down. So what did we do? We gave them 42 Donald Duck programs. I mean, that's not in the public interest either. It's not enough to not have it really violent. You have to have choice. You have to put on what's missing. Um, more people want to broadcast than there are available frequencies. We gave away the licenses, which some people have called a license to print money, and we said, in return for this license, you have to serve the public interest. Edward Parker made sure I got that lesson down pat. And without that, I never would have started ACT because there would have been no reason for anybody to listen to me. It's not like newspapers. It's not like the shoe business. There were years where all the shoes had four inch heels and pointy toes and I couldn't petition the government for comfortable shoes. But you can damn well petition the government for service from a system that is licensed to serve you. And that's what ACT's been doing. Over the last few years, the measures that held broadcasters accountable to the public have eroded. The NAB code was suspended in uh, 1982 when a federal judge ruled it a restraint of trade, which left the broadcasters without a set of good behavior standards. I don't think that really meant anything anyway, but at least it did limit the number of commercials on television for all of us. You'd think that, that the Justice Department would have found a little more injustice to move in on and then, then managing to get us so we got more commercial time permitted. I mean, with all the injustice in this country, I th would think they would be too busy for that one. Anyway, they did it. The Federal Trade Commission um, decided that it really didn't matter if uh, TV commercials to children were deceptive, so they got more deceptive. Um, it was really interesting what happened when the Federal Trade Commission had a case in front of it that said, you have to be careful in children's commercials. ACT loves to find horrible things to complain about. I mean, when we look at television, especially commercials, we look for the worst commercials we can find because you know, even, I mean, we have to have something to talk about. And in the early 70s, it was awful. And when, when everybody started to talk about it, when there were hearings, when, the, when Michael Perchick's FCC was focusing on the problem, you'd be amazed what happened. You could tell how big the toys were because the kids' hands and bodies were near the toy. They, the boats weren't going in rapids. I mean, who has rapids in their backyard? They didn't use fast, um, fast motion and slow motion. They, they sort of presented the product. They didn't tell you how much it cost. Maybe they didn't tell you that it wasn't really terrific for some age groups, and, and maybe they didn't tell you how hard it was to put together. But you did have a feel that when you went to the store, this is what you'd find. And ACT really couldn't find anything to complain about once you accepted the idea of selling to children who were too young to cross the street alone. We tried that to, to sort of say maybe children's TV could be a loss leader for the whole industry, but that didn't play, so we let it alone. But it got better, and then Reagan got elected. It continually amazes me when I think about it what an enormous difference his attitudes, his deregulatory attitudes meant in the television our children got to see. Mattel was operating under a consent order that they had to be very careful with their commercials because they had been so deceptive. So they went to the FTC and they said, you know, why should we have to do this now? Because nobody else is doing it. Everybody else is using these techniques. So why don't we, you let us do it too, and we'll watch very carefully what we do and make sure we don't do badly. I mean, it was the fox taking care of the chickens. And the, FCC, the Federal Trade Commission said, fine. And so even Mattel started to deceive kids again. 
During the Reagan era deregulation, TV rules were relaxed or eliminated. The number of stations or channels a single entity could own increased, resu resulting in these giant mega systems with little community affiliation. One of the real problems with television service now is that so much of it is absentee landlord problems. You know, they're not part of the community, so they don't respond to the community. The length of time a channel must operate before it could be sold went from three years to zero. So there was rapid turnover and some stations were up for sale twice within one year. The limits on commercial time per hour were removed. The stations were permitted to send in a postcard saying, we, we did what we're supposed to do without having to prove it. And the stations were freed from an obligation to serve children with Reagan's let em eat cable attitude. So we worked very hard with Congress and we got a bill to, to uh, President Reagan that he vetoed three days, he pocket vetoed it because he got it three days before the election so Congress disappeared and he just didn't do anything with it. But through the efforts of, of um, Congress people and senators like Markey and um, in a way, we got a bill back to the President's desk and although uh, Bush didn't sign it, he let it become law and on October 18th, the Children's Television Act passed. This act says that as a condition of license renewal, every station has to serve the education and information needs of children with programs specifically designed to meet those needs. Now that's really what Act's been trying to do for 20 years. It says it in plain English, although I'm sure that a lot of lawyers are gonna try to figure out how to get around it, but it says it. And it says specifically designed, it says children's programs. That's not public service announcements. That's not the superhero eating an orange at the end of a dumb cartoon and saying that's nutrition education. That's not sending Bozo to the local hospital. It's not collecting money for muscular dystrophy. It's programs. And that's what ACT has been talking about low these many years. Now the good news is that um, a station manager like Tom Hurwitz saw this bill and produced a pilot called Not Just News and took it to the broadcast meeting where they, uh, the, in the, for the syndication market, they decide what they're gonna do next year. And he sold it on the basis that it fulfilled the mandate of the children's television bill. Now that in a nutshell is just what ACT was trying to make happen. We were trying to create a market for the programs that couldn't get sold because there's no question that will get a smaller audience than Ninja Turtles. But it will get some audience. I mean, maybe the biography of Helen Keller gets a smaller readership than a big car uh, comic book, but kids read it. You can't keep it in the library. Uh, librarians know that. And in a service that's serving the public, everything doesn't have to get every kid to watch it when it's on the air. And I really think, although you have to know that I'm an optimist or I wouldn't have been doing this for 20 years, that the bill is gonna make a difference. Um, what else the bill does, it puts a limit on the number of commercials per hour. The limit is so high that it's really higher than adult prime time. The, network, uh, the networks just did a study that bragged that their number of minutes, advertising minutes per hour on prime time was nine minutes, 45 seconds. The, this was just released this past week. And the, the number of minute limit in this bill is 10 and a half minutes on weekends for kids and 12 minutes during the week. Uh, and the networks worked as hard as could be to get those numbers up that high. So we, we are faced with a situation where we're giving adults nine and a half, nine and minutes, 45 seconds, and children 10 and a half and 12, which shows how we value children in this broadcasting society. It's enough to make you nauseous. We think this bill is gonna be meaningful only insofar as people learn how to use it. The FCC is not gonna sit there and say yes and no to what stations are providing to children. And to a degree, that's really not bad. I don't know that I want a Jesse Helms controlled commission saying yes and no to programs. They might get all the wrong ones off the air, you know, the ones I like. Um, I think that it's, it's more important that the public know any particular public for any particular station know that that station is now obligated to serve its community's children. And we're gonna educate the pediatricians and the teachers and the parents and the mainstream religious groups and the health groups and all those groups that stood up with ACT to get this bill to pass, which have more than 60 million members, to, to let the broadcasters know that they know that this exists. Because certainly the broadcasters aren't gonna tell them, we're gonna tell them. And we think what's gonna make it work is that a station is successful if its community likes it. 
That's why they part the anchor's hair in a particular way. It's why they do all those things like, like help collect for um, nice causes. And if they get a reputation in town as being very disserving, very nasty to the community's children, maybe the community won't watch their news, won't watch their local programming. You like to be uh, you know, an upstanding member of the community, any corporation does. And we're going to use this bill to tell them that when it comes to serving the community, this is one place they better shape up. At least we think that's going to work. Uh, next, when I speak to you next time, we'll see. We'll see if it if it works. But don't you think that has a certain ring? For it? Absolutely. Good. Good. Anyway, um, the um, the dumb idea number seven is that TV is a plug-in drug. I'm almost done. TV is a plug-in drug, which is nonsense. Do you know that book by Marie Wynn? She spoke all over television about TV as a plug-in drug. She said that it doesn't matter if it's good, bad, and different. It doesn't matter what the program is. You shouldn't watch it because it's a drug. It flickers and, and a whole lot of other dumb things. Um, I don't know how many of you are watching public broadcasting's Masterpiece Theater this week, and um, it's House of Cards, a British program, and, um, and um, to Kinder. On, master, on the mystery. They are so good that I really um, want to rush home. Of course, my husband will tape it for me, so it's not a real problem. The VCR is very nice when, when you're not home all the time. Um, but when it's terrific, television is terrific. That's why I spent 22 years of my life trying to make it better. Um, one broadcasting entity that obviously cares is public television. We should all be working to make sure it has enough money to continue caring. Uh, I don't know how many of you know the nifty things they put on for kids. Um, besides the preschool programs, there's Three to One Contact and WonderWorks and Long Going Far Away and Reading Rainbow and Degrassi High. And, and they've made TV learning both in school and at home a high adventure. And uh, we think that's terrific. Cable has made the kinds of options possible for people that can afford it that didn't exist when I started ACT. And that's terrific. And, and, and that helps, but there's still the responsibility for each station to do it too. And home video is one of the best options of all, especially for young children. There's a whole lot of things on those video cassettes that you can rent and bring home, and I think that's terrific. Anyway, if knowledge is power, we have to do something about the fact that the new communications technologies work against the interests of many of us who are poor. Um, in a world where information is a prerequisite to responsible action, we can't afford to divide the audience into the TV haves and the TV have-nots. And one of the questions that schools like this should consider is how can we increase choice for those who can't afford those new technologies. ACT, for example, is talking libraries into carrying those video cassettes for kids and promoting um, the taking out of them for free. And the real answer is caring communications policy. Um, and the solution to ensuring that people who care light up that screen um, is to, in the ballot box, you have to elect the officials who are going to appoint the guardians of our airwaves because that's going to make it work better. I started ACT because I liked TV and I couldn't bear to see its potential wasted. And I still can't. And a lot of times when I'm talking about choice, broadcasters say, so Peggy, what is a good children's program? And I developed a five-point test. One, does it have something to say instead of something to sell? And two, which is submitted to an international animation or film festival for an award. I mean, so much of that stuff on Saturday morning is so badly animated. Would you put it at the top of a list for the lawyer who is defending you against a station challenge? Would parents tape it if their children were at the dentist? And would you mention it by name if your child's teacher asked you what you do for a living? I hope the Children's Television Act of 1990 means that more commercial broadcasters will answer yes to questions like those. Um, I know that the role of television isn't to replace families and teachers as the chief influence on, on kids in our society, but viewed selectively and with some terrific stuff to look at, it can help children to discuss and read and do all the things you want kids to do and lead them to ask questions. And as we set those new policies that are going to make the world make work better next year and after, I'd like to leave you with uh, the section on mass media, which was adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations at the December 89 Convention on the Rights of the Child. It says in part that mass media education should be directed to, quote, the preparation of the child for responsible life in a free society in the spirit of understanding, peace, tolerance, 
equality of sexes, and friendship among all peoples, ethnic, national, and religious groups. I think that's a meaningful prescription for the future of children's television. Anyway, thank you for asking me. kind of a resource. It did its own wiring and got itself into our houses so that it operates under a different mandate. What we say is that broadcasters serve adults much better than they serve children. They provide more choice and diversity and that we treat children as uh, really the most um, unvalued audience in broadcasting and our priorities should be just the other way around. I know that ACT got started up in Newton, Massachusetts, I guess in 1969. Am I correct? Well, actually, it was the end of 68, but you're close enough. All right. But uh, you've now got a, a feather in your cap. I believe it was last, um, was November? October. It was October. Right. Tell us what happened in October. Well, in October, after 22 years of yapping about the need to give children better service with television, we got the children's television bill. You have to understand that what Axe has been talking about all these many years is what's missing from children's television, not what's on. Most people who worry about kids and TV want to get rid of things they think aren't good for children, sex, violence, programs they don't like. Act feels that that's censorship and that the only way to talk about serving kids is to talk about what isn't there and hope we can train parents to turn it off more often when it's terrible. This bill does just that. It requires stations to serve the education and information needs of children with programs designed specifically to do that as a condition of license renewal. It took a long time, but it proves that perseverance wins in the end. So broadcasters have now promised that they're going to produce special programming for children. That's the essence of the children's bill? Let's not get carried away. The broadcasters haven't really promised anything. Congress has said to the broadcasters, you better do this or watch out. We think the dynamic that's going to make it work is that the more than 60 major national organizations that helped to make this happen, the pediatricians, the teachers, the uh, mainstream religious groups, um, or, uh, education and health organizations, they have more than 60 million members, just the ones that lined up with ACT at all our press conferences. We're going to educate all those people who are the audiences for stations across America to go to their stations and say, not take it off the air, we don't like it, but where is the stuff that our children are now entitled to? We think what's going to make it work is that broadcasters want to keep their communities happy, otherwise the community may not watch their news. That's why they send Bozo to the local hospital, that's why they part their anchor's hair in the right place. And if they start getting a reputation in the community for uh, not paying attention to that community's children, we think it won't be healthy for the broadcaster. And maybe that's why they'll start paying attention to kids. That sounds like a lot of common sense. And the question um, I have is why has it happened from the very beginning of broadcasting? One of the things I'm going to be talking about um, here today is the failure of self-regulation. The program we started about three years ago, and it, and it was a three-year program. We, we have solicited to the community and the business community for funds to buy these lights. And we were able to raise to date $7,000, for which we have spent already and bought these lights. And I believe some of these lights that we intended to install this coming year are stored in your village here. Now, 
how is this going to look? I mean, it'd be very sad to just see the Naranik Avenue lit up and see the surrounding area. First of all, all the lights that are up already, because this, this is main to the street. These lights have been uh, guaranteed to last from five to seven years, or seven to ten years. So, so really, whatever time you would put into it would be for the surrounding areas. And I truly hope you will give this a little more consideration. It's um, yeah. It's um, yeah. 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 Uh, we did discuss the uh, extending the time limit, the even at perhaps 7 o'clock. It was discussed at our last uh, budget meeting. Uh, I had discussed it uh, in the last week with uh, some of the uh, merchants on the avenue, and there's a possibility of raising additional revenues there. The other thing that exists with the meters on the avenue, and it's true, the meters were installed to pay off the tier parking structure and to turn over traffic. What's happening on the avenue now is constant feeding of the meter. We do have, uh, uh, Joe, don't we have the, whatever it is, progressive line, and we get the first ticket. If the car is still there, it's supposed to get a second ticket. Uh, that, that doesn't work that way all the time. Okay, but there is a progressive fund. There is, okay. yeah. The other thing be maintained by the court uh, okay. The other thing that's going on on the avenue, and I don't know if everybody is aware of it, is the fact that someone will park a car in front of the meter and insert the, what, 25 cents, and not activate the meter. Now, the only time that meter is activated is when the code enforcement officer comes along on his regular rounds and he turns that dial to activate to see if the mirror itself is working, and that's when the first quarter drops. That could be an hour, that could be two hours after, after that first initial quarter was put in, when the clock starts running. And Jim, I'm not sure as far as uh, uh, what the law is, but I, I believe the, the way I read it, and perhaps I'm wrong, you can correct me, is that when, when you park in front of a meter, you put the quarter in, and it's your responsibility to not to activate that meter. It's pretty clever. I'm going to try it. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try it. I don't think there's, there's anything that, the law doesn't contemplate who's going to activate the meter. So I just look the way it was drafted, and she and I worked for that for quite a while. Um, it was that you were limited uh, in the time that you can park, uh, that you had to pay for that time, but that you couldn't exceed the limit whether you paid for it or you did not. Wasn't there still a mark on the tires, Chief? Yes. Yeah, it still goes on. That's right. My, my, my so so it doesn't address who's to activate the meter. I mean, if someone puts a quarter in it and the meter is turned and there's time on it, I don't think the law deals with that issue to say that you're responsible to activate the media itself. Well, is it the code enforcement officer yeah. responsibility yeah. to go and activate the media? I would think that yeah. once you put the media in, no. part of the process yeah. is to turn that handle. Yeah. The code enforcement officer goes to a meter and the meter is showing a violation. He's got no obligation to turn the meter. Okay. He doesn't have to activate it. Okay. We can read the ticket if he sees the violation. I, 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 don't, I don't think that that's a, you know, before anybody starts uh, just figuring they're going to make out now. <laughs> Frankly, I, I don't really think that that is a, a, a big, you know, issue. And I mean, I certainly, I haven't heard of it. Uh, but, however, I, you know, I could certainly uh, take care of that matter without much of a problem. But the other thing is, Joe, that has come up is that I thought, or some people thought that it was a two-fold process. You not only have to put your money in the meter for the 90 minutes, but the tires would have been more so that nobody can continually feed the meter. I mean, I'm not so sure I think that's so awful, but it does present other problems to people who continually feed the meter. But I understand that they are not, in fact, blocking the tires. They did, they well, stopped, and now they may start again. Well, I, 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 I prefer to, uh, you know, to uh, take that all into consideration and talk to you about it, because there are certain problems and certain instances where it isn't being done all the time. Yeah. Uh, but there are specific reasons. I mean, if the goal of the meters were not just to make money, but also to create turnover so that people would have access to the stores on the Marinick Avenue, it's self-defeating if people are 
you know, I guess, feeding the meters, and then some of them apparently are swarmed. Well, you know, the not corporate you, enforcement right? officers pretty well know who they are, and uh, but are they we getting know, the, but then are they getting we do those have certain um, of the uh, merchants from the avenue that let us know about it, and we also, you know, so it, there's a pretty good a constant overview of, of who's doing it. We pretty well know who it is, and they do get some. But do they get the sequential tickets that we had thought we had? No, given? because we we don't we don't know if they've gotten summonses before that. Why you have records? Right. 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 I'm one of the merchants. I'm with Joe's Beat Place. Your name? No, uh, Joseph Gabriel. The only problem I have right now is they do mark the tires. Very rarely they mark the tires. People come out with wet tissue and wipe the tire. And they turn around and come back, and that car could be in front of my store for at least six hours. I mean, could they lose two marks? Is it too hard to do two marks so people can't see the second mark? If they do, come around and mark the tires. Now, if you raise it up, $10, we can't get people as it is to come down to the store as it is because of the fines. I mean, yeah, it's ridiculous. There's a, the Avenue is really getting empty as is. We came here almost two years ago because we loved the, you know, the Avenue was really nice. Everybody, not everybody's moving out because of the higher rents, whatever. It, now you kick $10 parking. It's totally ridiculous. People not even think about coming here. You go to Mary, people don't even go to America anymore. They go out because they can't find a place to park. I thought it was turnover. Yeah. Yes, Paul. Yeah, I live on the Avenue, 256 Memorial Avenue. I can tell you right now, I've been ticketed many times, and they are striping those tires. True enough, people are wiping them off. But those are basically merchants or people who live in Memorial who know they are striping the tires. If people come from out of town, they come in there and want to buy some goods in the store, those tires are being striped. They're being striped every afternoon. The guy comes through there, he comes through there regularly, and he stripes them. The people who are wiping them off are people who live in Romani, or they're merchants who, live on, who work on the avenue or park in their cars in front of them. Now, as far as the merchants are concerned, I do sympathize with some of you. And some of you people are parking in front of your own stores and you're taking the time from 9 o'clock in the morning up until sometimes till 11 o'clock in the afternoon. And there are a lot of cars that got tickets on them. The only problem I have is the ticket process because you're still sending my tickets to 636 Center Avenue. And by the time I turn around and come out and find a tow truck behind my car because they sent it to the wrong street, I don't mind paying the tickets because I'm wrong. But the thing about it is the system is to me kind of messed up because you're sending tickets to the wrong address. We're going to correct that. Mary Reed from Main House Shop. I just wanted to tell you that they don't mark the tires all the time. I am there six days a week, and they're not marking it all the time. It's done sometimes, not all the time. We have found in the past that when you mark the tires, that it works much better. And at one time we made a recommendation, I believe this is being used now in Largemont, where they have a computerized type of gadget that they use going around and they find that it's much more effective than marking it uh, with chalk. The other thing too is the $10 fine is rather steep, particularly at this economical time in our community when we are in a recession. The Marinette does have meter parking if you're comparing it with the, with the surrounding communities like Largemont or Harrison, well, they're much more wealthier community uh, per capita income, and they don't have meters. So I wish you would take that into consideration. Thank you. Hi, my name is Regan Kelly. I'm Melbourne Avenue. I'm also on the Budget Commission, and I've been holding my tongue here. I think it's great, first off, just to see the democratic process because everyone's coming here and is involved. The other thing is, is we're sort of, you know, you can't blame these people. We've heard the economy's no good. There's no money coming from anywhere. So it's nice to hear everybody has their pleas for money. We want to keep culture alive. We want to keep libraries alive. We get people arguing they don't want to pay extra in fines. Somewhere it's a question of balance. It's a question of trying to balance like your own checkbook at home. You know, you want to have a new carpet in the living room, but you don't want to pay for the carpet. It's a matter of if we as a village in each special group, that whether your library or whether you've got to do with uh, the Emlyn Theater or Harbor Island, we all have specific things we want. But when it comes time to pay the piper, let's not yell at the people up here. Because we as a whole, as citizens, and that's what the Budget Commission is, just us regular old taxpayers, is let's make our choices, 
let's say this is what we want, and when they turn around and Lenny says, all right, that's going to equate to a 12% property tax increase, then all of us that sit back, we keep our mouth shut, we pay the piper, all right? That's what I'm trying to get across. Some of these things as the Budget Commission are very hard because you want to be compassionate. You know, some of the things we looked at and we said, all right, if a man can afford a quarter of a million dollar yacht, perhaps he can pay a few extra bucks a foot. Let's say somebody that can't afford to go to a summer school so much with a working family, let's keep that price down. And here an instance where it came to tickets. The law was that you parked X amount of time. And I can emphasize, with because I have to park at the same meters in my office, but that's the law. And we were saying is if you want to break the law, instead of paying $5, let's pay $10. And that brought $40,000 in. And if we can all look at this as dollars and cents, and we can say that that $40,000 raised, 20 of that could pay for the, the somebody had a $20,000 budget. I think it was the other one. It's a matter of where do you want to take it from? Somebody, we, we can't have everything. Or yes, we can have everything, but let's tell all of them that we're willing to pay the extra price. And if we're willing to do that, then let's not complain that the taxes are going up. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Yes, I, I think this gentleman has made an excellent point. We have to pay for the things we want, but we have to also make sure that our money is being distributed equitably. Well, that's what I said in the beginning. I agree with you. And I don't think this budget does that. Absolutely. If I hear that Harbor Island is being subsidized for $36,000, I think the people who use Harbor Island should help to subsidize it. I use the Emerlin Theater. I, give, I donate money every year apart from my ticket price just because I feel as a member of the community that I must come up with some voluntary money to keep it going. But, you know, I, I, I really think there has to be a little fairer division of where our monies are going, and I don't see that. Well, I agree. That's, you know, not to pick on the library, but that's one of the reasons right. I, I, I felt that way. I, I, I think we can... I think $10 is too expensive to pay if it's going to raise... Well, I don't know about that. I, know. I think I, I would support an increase. I think doubling it, I mean, for a lot of money, it really... Yes, uh, I think. Uh, I think we're in Walton Avenue. I partly agree with the gentleman in terms of money in equal money out, and you can't absolutely disagree with that. But I think there's a responsibility that the group in front of me has which can't be avoided. And I think that many people would like to uh, pay whatever is necessary to get the services. But you up there have got to judiciously be sure there's no waste in government. Now, I didn't study this budget, OK? And I didn't pretend to that you ran out of copies. It was in large demand. But running through it very quickly, I didn't count the number of stenographers and assistant stenographers. I have no input into the process. I just took a quick run through. I noticed a couple of positions were cut out. And I know in business, when you cut out top positions, you usually cut out support people. And I've not seen that. And I don't pretend to have fully studied it, but a quick through, run through gave me that. Well, that's exactly what we did. I mean, three, three full time and, and seven and a half part time. But there's Most of the part time are, are at a support level. I mean, that, which is troublesome because what the, I mean, I, Regan, I think, hit the nail on the head. But I, I, another caveat is that this budget, where it adopted, will result in less service provided to this community. I mean, they're cutting out a code enforcement officer on Mamaroneck Avenue. Now, we know how aesthetics are important. Uh, we cut back on garbage collection properly uh, because we were just collecting more than we should. But if we don't enforce that, there will be garbage on the Marinick Avenue on the weekends, and no one will shop here because it will look like hell. And I am concerned because that is only a five or $6,000 expenditure, but it makes for a cleaner and more aesthetically pleasing community, which we know from the Master Plan Survey is very important to the residents of this village. And I don't think that's a cut that, sh that should uh, you know, be kept in here. But I'm saying we're cutting out people in a lot of departments. Uh, if, if someone is sick and we're down to a one-man building department, uh, there will be less service provided. People will not get CLOs for closings as quickly as they do. Uh, we have overcrowding in this village. We have a lot of housing code violations that will not be addressed. Those are the kinds of issues that concern me greatly. And I think that uh, when, we, when the people realize that, that there may be far less service for what they are paying, uh, people will be less happy than they are now. And, and, and as we can say, we're going to either pay for it or not. But in terms of the equitable, uh, I mean, going back to the library, I mean, can we provide 
the same level of service for less money, or can we do the same thing for, for fewer hours? I, they're saying no, but the point is, something has to give, because we, the people who, who are here, and all of us are paying high taxes, but we are operating in this community, in this area, under an oppressive real property tax burden. It is driving people away, in, in, you know, you know how many houses are on the market today. Uh, now granted, and I will say this with my dying breath, that the village tax is your, is your smallest tax, it is not, you know, the one tax that I think is, is bad, but they're all bad. And as you see your taxes increasing, it is creating a real burden for a lot of people. And I think when we look at 11% tax hike, which everyone has said is too high, uh, something has to give. And I, you know, April 8th, I couldn't tell you what it's going to be, but come May 1st, something in here is going to go, and I don't know what it is. But uh, I think in terms of cutting support staff, even which is being done in this budget, you're going to see less services and, and a lot of annoyed people uh, as a result saying, well, you know, I do pay such and such amount of taxes, what am I getting for it? And the answer is you're going to be getting less, and that's unfortunate. We're accustomed to certain things here. Paul, can, yeah. I, can I address Mr. Gordon's yeah. comments just for a moment? Uh, because I would invite you to look at the Constitution, and I know that you're a, a CPA by training and, and profession. I invite you to look at this budget. In fact, we, what we have here, Mr. Gordon, is something which uh, was very carefully brought uh, I think by Lenny Grastro and Angela Grillo, and in fact calls for uh, a, a, a savings, if you will, of, of $350,000, which is four points on the tax roll, all right? There are some people who it is recommended in this tentative budget uh, uh, lose their jobs. It's true. But I, I think that one of the things that hasn't been said here, and I'd like to say it, and, and I think that, that we, I, I think that we all intuitively uh, feel this way, is that in these times, for everybody, and and, uh, and Carmen said it, and other people have said it in other ways, and, and we should say it again, is that when things are difficult, everybody is going to have to tighten their belts a little bit and work a little bit harder. And I don't think that necessarily what we're seeing here is a, a diminishment of the services. Sure, I mean, we are going to have to look at different ways of doing things. And we're going to have to perhaps ask some people to work in different ways and to work perhaps harder. But I think, I, I mean, I've spent many, many hours with Lenny and with Angela over this budget in the course of the last two months. It happens to be a subject that I also am, am very vitally interested in. And uh, Lenny and I spent a couple of hours today. Can't we cut some more here? Can't we cut some uh, more there? And I'm telling you, I mean, my judgment is that they, what they have done here is a judicious trimming of expenses. I invite you to make your own determination about this. They made a judicious trimming of, of expenses, and it's still an 11% tax increase. I, I mean, I would echo what Reagan is saying here. I think that if everyone thinks that 11% is okay or 12% is okay, that's one thing. But, you know, I, I frankly don't think it is. I think that we've got a starting out point here in the budget, which is well wrought and clean. And sure, there are some people who are unfortunately going to lose their jobs. It, and there are some functions which are going to have to be done by other people. I don't think it necessarily means a di diminution in services. I really don't. I, and, I, and I think that I echo the, the people who we've hired to manage this village when I say that. Um, let me just talk for a second, if I might, since I seem to have the floor, about the fines and, and, uh, and, and what's been said here. I mean, I appreciate what Mary's saying, and I appreciate what the man, the jelly bean man, was saying. I don't remember his name. Uh, but, you know, I, you know, to a certain extent, for our business district, it's difficult to compete with other business districts where there are no meters. If you think that the only arena that you're competing on is fines. But I think the availability of space, certainly from my point of view as a shopper, is a very vital thing. And that's a question, as, as the police chief was saying, of enforcement. I mean, if I come down, as I'm sure all shoppers, you know, to go to Rye, to go to Harrison, to go to Larchmont, if you can find a space and you put a quarter in the meter, you know, that's it. If you can't find a space, then you go elsewhere. 
you do not not shop here in in uh, in uh, with the choice between here and Larchmont because of the $10 fine. It's a convenience thing, and it doesn't have to do with the fine. I don't think. I mean, I hear what you're saying, and I appreciate what you're saying, but I think turnover probably is a more important thing in the availability of spaces than the fine. Because there aren't there aren't meters in the adjacent communities, so you can't you can't compare those two things. I think it's convenience, and 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 the fact that the stores are filled or not filled, which all has to do, of course, with the rent, which all comes back to taxes. So you know we're sort of you know it's a it's a little bit of a conundrum, but uh, it, I don't really think that that's fine if we really think about it, is the only reason that people would choose not to shop here. They can find a space. Uh, wait a second. Do you want to take a moment? Yeah, no, I, I, I just want to say, in the budget, the way the budget is presented now, or as I see it, and unless I see it differently, uh, there are cuts in services. When we talk about cutting the current enforcement in uh, uh, offices on the avenue, and as the mayor said, the avenue is going to turn into a, 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 a real uh, not an attractive place to walk in without that code enforcement officer. He's up there, he's, he's doing his job. The other thing that uh, that you, you, you're cutting out, or, or, or at least uh, potentially cutting out, is the assistant building inspector. Now, you have, you have, and then maybe you don't have knowledge of it, but I do, you have a serious problem in this village. Okay, and that was uh, over Running as far as apartments go. And sooner or later, and I said this last year, and I'll say it again because I want to be on record, we're going to have a, a, a very, very bad fire in this village. And with the overcrowded conditions you have, with a lot of illegal apartments, you're going to have some debts. And you do away with the assistant building inspector. He should be out there, and he should be checking. You're walking around this village, campaigning. I've come upon many houses that were two family houses with 10 and 12 and 14 people in sleeping on the floor with a mattress. This is what you have going on now. And if this village board don't move to correct this situation now, you're going to have a very, very serious problem in this village as far as uh, fire goes. And I think that that's one of the things that I would be opposed to to reduce the system building inspector. If anything, you need him more now than you needed him before. And, and that's just to do that job and take care of those types of apartments. If we add everything back, that's been eliminated through the hard work of Lenny, we're looking at a 15% tax increase. Everyone should just realize that. I, I, As we start, I mean, just to give you a, a sense of what $350,000 that has been very assiduously uh, pulled out of your tax increase, if we add it all back, we're looking at 15 percent. Andrew? Yeah, um, judging from what we've been hearing tonight, quality of life issues are really important to people who show up here tonight. Is there any consensus on the board in terms of what is important, whether quality of life, whether taxes, whether services, um, which way the board wants to go, depending on what we've heard here tonight? It's only 40 to 10. I, I don't want to hear. I, I wouldn't say, I mean, I agree that quality of life is important, and I think that, that, that quality of life runs across the board. I mean, from, from people who work here and have stores on the avenue, because it's their life too, to the people that use the park, to the people that go to the inland, uh, someone like me who covers all three. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a tough call. As I've said from the beginning, all, all I ask is that the benefits and the bur burdens be shared equitably. And that, uh, that you know, even Kate said, everybody has to tighten their belt and everybody has to work harder uh, with a little bit less and that, that should be across the board. As I said earlier, I don't think this budget does that yet. But it's only April 8th and we have three weeks to do it and see if there are adjustments that could be made. But, you know, even Kelly hit the nail on the head. If, if, if we all get what we want, then there will be higher village property taxes, which nobody wants. So. Uh, it, this is the, it, we've been doing this balancing act for many years and we'll continue to do it. But if the taxes continue to go up or even stay at 11 percent, we won't be talking about quality of life, we'll be talking about life. Yeah. Because for some people, people it's, uh, about, this will be, that will be the death knell for people yeah. being able to okay. stay in this Jack, place. you're new at something. Jack Shaz, I'm in Monroe Avenue. Is, is 
has, it, has anybody looked into uh, the possibility of, of replacing the, the cuts in the quality of life or the recreational cultural uh, uh, services uh, funding those or replacing that, that uh, the shortfalls by, by the funding that was uh, brought up before? In other words, raising the beach fees or perhaps charging the uh, Well, yes. Yeah, yeah, so to respond to that, what I'm Tennessee. hearing from the people who want the beach open, who want to maintain the hours in the library, who want to have the, the cultural uh, quality of the inland, those are the same people who come to us and say, we can't afford the tax rate here any longer. So we're in a real uh, catch-22 situation on how can we provide these services and still have all the taxpayers uh, pay through it or pay for it through their property taxes. You're right. Unless we find a way for the users of these facilities to pay for that use, we're going to have to charge all the taxpayers. And this is a thing that the taxpayers are saying they can no longer afford. Well, if, if you, I mean, once it's a tax, it's a tax forever. I mean, if there's, we get to a certain point, uh, which obviously we're at now. I think the time has come for for the people who use them, regardless of what happens. Right. Well, philosophically, but I think one of the issues that arose during the, the debate on the beach is that maybe the high cost of going to the beach discouraged some people from using it, which of course left us with fewer people. But I think with other like boating and tennis and and the other things that uh, we have. There are efforts being made and recommendations are coming in to increase so that they become at least self-sustaining, which is one of the reasons we installed parking meters was to pay for the tiers so we didn't have to raise property taxes for that purpose, which I think was fair and equitable. Those that use it uh, and park here should pay for it. But I think what the board has to do is distinguish between necessity and convenience. We, over the years, and, and because we live in a, in a wealthy society, meaning this country, uh, and times used to be fairly good uh, compared to now, when we had the, the, the revenue, we were not uh, reluctant to increase quality of life expenditures because they affect all of us and make our property values that much higher. Today, as we are in a, a period of retrenchment, we have to look back and look harder and say what is really necessary in terms of providing services from a municipal government and what is a, a, a convenience that we used to pay for and maybe we can't afford. And that's always a tough philosophical question that any budget addresses. And I, I think this year more than any other. But I also want to echo one thing and hope everybody in this room recognizes that the real culprit in all of this is the state government. I mean, if we didn't have these cuts, uh, we may not have all these people here because we probably could have restored most of it and not had 11% tax hike. So as you follow the machinations in Albany, keep in mind that, that a lot of this uh, stems from what happened there. Yes. But the uh, other thing about yeah. raising fees is they're really, it's something that we have to discuss as a board, and this is why we've asked for instance, the Harbor Commission uh, to deal with the boating fees and the Recreation Commission to deal with some of the issues involving the daily attendance at the beach and parking is how much of the actual cost of whatever it is that they're talking about should be borne by the user. You know, should the total cost of supporting the beach be borne by only those people who use the beach? Or is it an amenity that even though those of us don't use it, still we should share in some portion of the course. So there really is a, a question in there on which things are, should be borne only by the users, and which should also be, to some extent, uh, you want to say subsidized, but something that should be um, a basic, say a basic uh, amount should go towards one service, and then the rest of that should be borne by the users. And we haven't hit that yet. Yes, because what we've had usually is, we had years where more and more people bought tennis permits. Now it's on the decline. We had, uh, for a long time, we had um, the uh, feeds for the dogs and for the mooring were not raised in every couple of years so that they got out of whack. And we are considerably lower than any other municipality and certainly than the private uh, marina. So there's a way that we may raise it there. In terms of the beach, the other thing that's happened is that we have, um, I, you know, the, uh, the fees there are relatively low, um, but on the other hand, the percentage of people that are using them has dropped some. So the proportion that is shared in the cost is just not there. So this is the year. I mean, we're trying very hard to do it. What I hear from a lot of people is that they want certain things restored. I haven't heard anybody <laughs> give us either something that could be cut out. Or if you don't want to do that, you know, a great way of raising money. I mean, I don't know whether the village should go out and buy lottery tickets every week because there's got to be some way that we can deal with this kind of, if everybody has only wants and we have only a certain amount of money that we can that we can share, it's got to be made in some proportional way. And we're not, we're only still here in wants. 
Uh, this is the one you had your minute for a while. Yeah. I think it's all well and good for you to tell us that we have to tighten our belts a little bit, but I think you really should set an example yourselves. Um, when you make decisions to do things like the lights and then find out that they're done improperly and you have to pay additional engineer's fees, I think what you're doing is that the fees that you spent is what you would normally give to the Emlyn Theater. Uh, and no. That's not engineers. No, the money came from the Girl Scout fund, so it, it was not a penny came from the property tax there. Come from the Girl Scout. Fund. No, it's only for recreation. Money around. And ten thousand came from private. Yeah, so. And I think that you have to take the link for that. Uh, you know, stop everyone else to pick up the all the time. But we did. I mean, they raised the money privately. I thought it was a good example. Yes. Linda, can, uh, can I just comment on that? Yes. 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 Not the lights. But let me just talk about the one of the things that we have done this year, two things that I, I think that um, the community should be aware of is that one, we established a permanent budget committee that reviews uh, all capital expenditures and also does special studies for the board. For instance, for several months, as, as Reagan would tell you, they've been working on the uh, comparative fee study, and now they've developed some data which tells, which tells anyone, including us and, and, and the village manager and the public, what other communities charge for what I would call ancillary services, not police, not fire, but things like building permits and site plan reviews, et cetera. And, and that's been a lot of work for the budget committee. They also have reviewed very stringently every capital expenditure this year so that we are in position to have carefully scrutinized everything that we have approved this year on the board. The other thing that is that has taken place this year that I think we, we all should know about and I feel very proud of because I was concerned about it when I was um, running uh, for trustee was we have established for the first time with the help of Lenny or through Lenny and Angela Grillo a five-year capital budget. Last year the capital budget that was presented within this budget, the tentative budget, uh, was incomplete. It wasn't. It was not uh, anything that you could really work off. This year, we have an idea from the department heads through the village manager what exactly the capital needs are going to be for five years. And of course, there'll be changes. Of course, there'll be emergencies. But we have a sense of what the demands are going to be on the taxpayer for the next five years, and that is something that I, I think that people should know has happened really through through the workings of the budget committee and Lenny and Angela we were trying to get a handle and not just send money uh, uh, as emergencies arise yes if I may um, I feel kind of fear that this that the beach colors want subs to be subsidized um, I'm a senior citizen. I go to beach free. I park free. However, I had a family of five children, and I owned two properties at one time. And who did I subsidize for 40 years? That's not what I said, though. What I said was there are some things that should be borne by the users who use whatever it is. Okay. And there are others that should be is something that I think it goes to what makes Mamari Mamari, and the beach may well be one of those things. And in that sense, everybody right. pays something towards that to a certain level, exactly. and then after that, it should be those who okay. pay use, and that's what I said. All right, now what I would like to explain to you is that everybody's home in this village is valuable because of the things, the amenities that we have to offer. Mm. Yeah. That's right, that's my point. Mm. Sam. Uh, I understand why I'm going to chat for its furniture. I've been on the avenue since 1942. When we moved into this avenue, I would say there were at least 40 buildings that were for rent. Since then, the village has blossomed. A few years ago, we had everything was rented. Well, I feel that if you raise this parking fee, we're going to deter people from coming to the village to farm. There is nothing that aggravates a person more than getting a parking ticket. And half of my customers who come in have a complaint that the $5 fee because you can shop in the other community without 
Hey, I guess they get uh, it just deteriorates the, the whole relationship of the village. It's supposed to be the friendly village. I get people going on here so mad they'll never come back. And I really do feel that, that a raise in the fee would be a complete detriment. And I would like to address one more thing. I'm a former member of the Harvard Division, and I see you are eliminating the assistant Harvard Master. And I really have no idea how the hustle master could operate without a helper. He has to put in booty, he has to tow boats, he has to go out and get boats that slip off the building. And being a boatman, there's very little you can do in a boat by yourself. And I think you should really look into that situation, possibly use him a period of time, as I expect to let it do for, and put him on some other work for the period in the harbor is slow, but there must be some way to keep someone to gym to work with them. Thank you. Okay. And you would thank all the dead you. First of all, I want to just make a comment from Mr. Rogers with the overcrowding. When you had full stuff, the overcrowding was just in the same as in heaven. And uh, having worked on the census for the last, for the last year, I've seen, unfortunately, the dangers of the um, As far as cutting off the uh, services is concerned, I realize funds are very tight. They are tight all around us. It's uh, statewide, it's uh, nationwide. Uh, why not start something like a local vista. This year, many of the uh, students will not find jobs. They will have time on hand. They could render service. Uh, they could be well equipped. They could work with the different departments that need the services. It might be something to be considered. We also have many people who are unemployed. Uh, who probably would be very happy to do something useful. Uh, maybe you can think of, along these lines to supplement the lack of services. Uh, yes, we have a, a very low sales tax in this community. I realize this is perhaps a sort of popular subject. But what are we paying? Five and three quarter percent? Yes, so far. Who, who has the power to levy a higher tax than the local community? Well, you should ask. We, uh, as the, uh, <laughs> No, we don't. We, unfortunately, the, the county government can, can levy and increase the sales tax. And there is currently a, a, a debate going on now in Albany whereby the county has, and the Village Officials Association and others have asked permission to permit the county to increase the sales tax and distribute that money among the towns and villages and school districts, which would make up a substantial, as a matter of fact, we would make $1.7 million a year from that increase from five and three quarters to seven and a quarter. Now, uh, keep in mind that is not a popular position among members of the Chamber of Commerce throughout Westchester County that I'm aware of. I'm not sure if the county chamber took a position, but I'm, I'm pretty sure most local merchants would be against it. But the, the plus side is that it would be a county-wide sales tax, so we wouldn't necessarily lose a competitive advantage with regards to Rye or Larchmont. But only the, Albany can do that. There is legislation that has been discussed it passed the Senate. It's being held up in the Assembly by uh, two local assemblymen. Uh, I, I personally have always supported it because I think we, we need the revenue, and I, I would rather pay a few pennies on a sales tax, which is also somewhat regressive, but not as regressive as the property tax. And we could actually not only refund some of these things, but actually reduce property taxes in the long run because it would be $1.7 million each year, not just a one-shot allocation. And uh, we are trying, if you want to add your voice to that lobbying effort, I'd be happy to give you the information who to contact with. We, we need the revenue. I mean, that is, I mean, one thing we didn't point out, I think many mentioned, is that this budget, uh, in fact, our spending did not increase. Uh, the spending only went up 2.5%, which is well below the rate of inflation. In fact, it's the loss of revenue that has, has uh, fueled these increases, and that's uh, to some extent we have tightened our belts. Can yeah. I just ask another question? Sure. Are you empowered in the budget? No. The village is not sales tax. No, no, not sales tax. No. To, 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 to place some sort of a proportionate surcharge uh, to cover operating expenses 
over over your over the taxes that you uh, levy. Uh, like a surcharge on the property tax? Yes. For example, if I if I belong to a condominium and we have a deficit, we have to come up with right. assessment. We no. assess everybody. We can't do that. According to the size of the property. The state legislature can do a surcharge on income tax, but we can't do property tax surcharge because it's based on an assessed value, and it's, it's a, not that that would be popular either. No. Right. What about volunteer services to the community that would replace paid positions? That's kind of how we even. It's, the problem is you don't have any accountability. I mean, you can't penalize a volunteer if they don't show up for work. I mean, there's just no way to control it. I mean, at least we have some sense of accountability. I mean, like. Somebody said, you know, maybe volunteer lifeguards. Well, you, you can't control a volunteer lifeguard. You have no, I mean, if they don't show up, or, it's a big responsibility. That's why people get paid partially for responsibility as well as it is for time. And I don't see how it would work. Uh, we used to have CETA in the old days, but that, as you know, it was a federal program that, you know, was unfunded. One of the other things that can occur, and we may be, you know, yeah. pushed a little bit faster now to do some of this, is to start to talk to other municipalities, to the school districts, about ways that we can share identical and or similar expenses. And going through this budget at this time has really indicated there are some things. I mean, it may not be a lot, and it certainly won't be popular in the beginning, but there has to be some level talking ground in which we start to discuss some of the costs that we have identical to each other and see if there's some savings in that. Uh, I'm sorry, Sandy. You well, uh, one of the questions I was going to ask you, you, you had already answered, but I just wanted to call everyone's attention that uh, Assemblyman Roski has had a change of heart, and it looks like he's going to vote for that increase in sales tax. Of course, we of the Chamber of Commerce are not very really happy about it. I know. But another question is, will you, uh, will you, uh, go ahead with these cuts, or would you go back to the original uh, budget that we had last year? If, in if, regards to, if, if, if we got the sales tax? If the sales tax goes through when you do realize this additional revenue. I, if, if it were, I mean, I, the proposal that you're referring to is one in which the county doesn't receive any revenue, so I'm, I'm, right. I'm not sure that it'll happen because obviously everybody wants a piece of the action. Well, um, this is what Right. I don't, I don't know how much, but if it were enacted, it would only take effect in the middle of the year. In other words, it would be September, so we would not get the $1.7 annually until the following budget year. Uh, will we restore the cuts? I don't know. I think, honestly, I would, my recommendation would be to, to, some, to restore some of them that I've already said should be restored anyway. Uh, I think, by and large, many would be restored, but I can't, the board hasn't discussed that. But I would honestly would rather see the money go to, to reducing, actually reducing property taxes and, and, and stabilizing them in the long run than necessarily. And my fear is that with any municipality, you'd have all this extra revenue and you'd say, great, now we can do all these things that we never could do before, which would not necessarily be the prudent thing to do. But I think a lot of these cuts are very small. I mean, 5000 for code enforcement or 20000 for the Emlyn. I mean, those aren't cuts that in my view are going to break a budget of $13.5 million. Uh, so I think those cuts would probably be restored, but we've not really discussed it because no one thinks it's ever going to happen. Well, I, I also just want to call attention to the parking funds that if you could implement a progressive parking uh, fund, that I think you would realize the, the you know the difference in leaving the fine as is and versus raising it because it really will, will hurt the merchant. I know, I know psychologically that as a, uh, a, a shopper say that, that if I'm going to be fined $10, I will never go back to that you know, particular shopping area to shop. And this will hurt the merchant. I, I, I agree with you on that. Anybody else want to comment on the budget? Yes. Hi, Nick Gordon. Um, I'm listening to all this, and, I, and it's really a shame that this has happened, but I just want to make one point. This has really been a very bad year for everyone, and there are a lot of people in this area who have lost their jobs. If you keep your citizen, it's going to be a long, tough summer. You eliminate the beach, and you eliminate the library. Now, having been in our library all the time, I see there are people there working on their resumes, 
go into all the various res uh, reference areas that we have, try to find out how to get back on the feet. Same thing with the theater. This is a resource that keeps all these people who are losing their job. And you've got a lot of kids who are not going to get jobs this summer, too. And where are they going to go? That's one side. The other side is <coughs> what I have always find found fascinating is you know, you're very wealthy people in this community belong to the, to the clubs. They're not affected by the beach. Also, you wealthy people, for the most part, don't go to the library. They buy the books. If there was some way I could get people who buy the books to give the money to the library and reserve them the way I do and take it out of the library, you would get lots of money. But we can't. And having done fundraising for God knows how many years and still doing it all the time, if there was some way that we could make people do what they should do, we wouldn't have half of these problems, those who have, you know, to share with those who don't. But, long, thank Joe, you. Joe, let me, let me just explain to you, this was not a, 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 a intimidating uh, a remark that I made. It wasn't addressed to you. It was not addressed to any particular office that works in this building. I, I am saying to you that this condition does exist. I'm not on the avenue to say to you, I was for many years, and it existed then. This was, this was prior to you being chief. I am saying the same, the, same, uh, the same condition still exists. Why is it? We want you to refine these, these merchants. I, I don't want you picking on customers, uh, positively not. But, but they know the same merchant that parks there day in and day out six days a week. They certainly know who they are. These people should not be on the avenue. These parking spaces are for customers. And I've been preaching this all these years, and I still say it. Okay, Jerry, last word. Jerry McCray to Washington Street. I just want to clarify something I had heard here earlier in the evening. That is, we don't have very many quarter of a million dollar yachts in this harbor. And if we did, maybe those people would be happy to get a few extra dollars. Two years ago, maybe, I did a survey of the, dock, of the boats on a dock. Those boats ranged in value on average between four and $5,000. That does not include any things or anything like that that is for the boats on a dock. If you, if you resurvey those boats this year and took into consideration also the these space boats, I have a feeling that because of the boat economy, the average value may be well below $4,000 for you know, the boat. We're talking about average people here that own these boats. Um, so I'm saying when you're looking at boat fees, I'm looking here at a budget that showed last year the Harvard Baptist Department had about a hundred and twenty-two thousand dollar budget, and um, they took in about one hundred and eighty thousand dollars in revenues. I know there are other things to be considered here that aren't included under the Harvard Baptist Department, but still. I see something that's pretty much paying for itself. I don't see that the taxpayers are really subsidizing the boat owners in this village, and I wish the boat to take this into consideration. The other thing is that I see here a big decrease in the Harbor Masters Department budget, and what I don't understand is, I know there's a big, you show me the big, big decrease here, I don't agree with it necessarily, all of it, but what I don't understand is why other departments don't show similar decreases. Why this is one of the biggest ones around? Are you trying to forget that we have a waterfront community here, uh, closing of a beach and eliminating large amounts from this budget? Um, it shows me that we're forgetting that we do have a waterfront here, and I think it's a benefit of everybody in this village to remember that we do have a community that should be keeping tax dollars. To in the waterfront area. Okay, I, I, we have to put this off because we're doing uh, the roof next, so we will put this over one week till next Monday, the fir April 15th, a great day to talk about taxes. Um, motion to adjourn to April 15th at 8 o'clock. Second. Second. I'm sorry, what's the motion? There's a two minute break and then we're going to do the roof.
Thanks, Alan. Oh. Alan Gary. Yeah, he's I nice. remember him. Alan, yeah, every time you come, we have the Emlyn, we have the lights, uh, the firehouse. Uh, how can I follow that act that I just saw here? Every time you're here, it's a hot potato. Are you the cause of your youth? All you have to do is ask for money, Alan. I, I know, I'm afraid. I'm no. afraid of that. No, no, no. And, and tonight you're here for que questions only. Okay. Uh, 3B, Village Hall Roof Renovation, another project that seems endless. Okay. We will, uh... Some more than I, I, I want to stand so I can run. <laughs> All right, well, for the record, we've received uh, bids, three bids, proposals for the Village Hall roof renovation. A, a recommendation was made by Alan Gary, who was our uh, consultant. And the low bidder was 254000 which was from Barrett Nonpareil Roofing, Inc., and it includes complete removal and replacement of 261 LF copper cornice and gutter, as well as the roof area, which consists of approximately 3,440 square feet of clay tile, the repair and replacement of wood catwalks and five dormer copper valleys, two sides each, repair and repointing of the brick chimney, and the removal of obsolete radio antenna. Uh, the roof is approximately 104 years old. Hmm. Uh, it is the recommendation that we commit to the expenditure of $254,000 based on an am the amortization of a minimum of 75 years computes to a cost of 3386 a year for the complete restoration. Okay. Mr. Gary is here. Uh, he will not, uh, does not wish to make a presentation, but will answer any questions anyone may have. Correct? That's correct. Okay. Any questions anyone may have? Can I say 75 years for? Yeah, that's the estimated life. Alan, well, can we dance on the roof in 75 years? <laughs> we could, but we won't be here. <laughs> Alan, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, I, I got out my previous reports, um, and I'm looking at one, I think it's the first one, May 1990, when several alternative materials were suggested. And in that, uh, in addition to Spanish tile, there were a couple of uh, metal uh, suggestions, and there, there also was a, uh, a uh, asphalt suggestion. But I was unclear as I looked over these kind of scoping <laughs> estimates whether they were as comprehensive as what is proposed here. Yes. Uh, the bids uh, came in uh, the last time we went to bid, we had the metal roofing in there, and much to our uh, surprise, the metal roof came out to be more expensive than the clay tile. Now, the asphalt uh, roofing is something after further study, which gave us an opportunity when we did the drawings, is to go against uh, putting up uh, asphalt roofing, such as uh, Timberline or any of these. Uh, different types of products put out by different various manufacturers. And the reason why we dropped asphalt roofing is because asphalt roofing on a high building is not recommended. Now, let me give you some technical points on asphalt roofing. To your eaves of this building, you're talking about 38 feet from ground level. And I've got to put that on the north side of the building because the south side of the building is higher. And from your eave to your ridge you have an additional 11 feet, so you're around 49 feet high. The other thing about this building is it happens to be on one, not the highest part of the village of Mamaronek. We know Harbor Heights is higher, but our topography here above sea level is much higher than a lot of the surrounding area. So that adds to the elevation. Now, I think the last severe storm we experienced in uh, this area here was in 1976, which was a uh, tropical storm, David. Started out as a hurricane, turned into a tropical storm. At sea level, that storm was 60 miles an hour. If you elevate your storms to a period, say, to a height of 100 feet, 50 feet. In our case here, it's 49 feet. The wind uplift on a 32-degree roof is not recommended for asphalt roof. 
You have a 32 degree gabled roof on this building. And the height in that gable degree is not recommended for asphalt roof. Let me tell you something else about asphalt roof. We did get a bid for asphalt roof very early. And they talked about $80,000 to put up an asphalt roof. $80,000, and the most you'll get out of it is maybe 25 years. Now, the $80,000 was just to put the asphalt roofing up. We also have to consider all the other work that's being done up there. That's the question. Now, so what we can say is, do we want to get away with 25 years for a municipality? I say put the asphalt roof up. It cost you $80,000. But, but Alan, would we also have the same cost as broken down by this company as you did it, which said it would still cost 10000 for mobilization? Exactly. It would cost 21000 I mean, all those other costs, would they be there? Because what they're saying on this with the eight items is that the tile roofing cost is 75000 yes. So in a sense, if all those other costs are the same, what you're saying is the asphalt roof could be $5,000 more. The is asphalt right? roofing, first of all, you still have to take the clay tile off. What do you have there for that? We have mobilization. Know. We have scaffolding. Mobilization. Mobilization is a is a term a contractor uses right. to gear up, to That's buy right. and get here. Right. The trailers. It's what you're probably in general condition, basically. So it'd still be another a cost. You're still going to have mobilization. 10, then you have scaffolding. All right. Demolition is thirty-eight thousand. That's what the lowest price is to take. The demolition is to take the old roof off. Okay. Carpentry. You've got 4,430 square feet of roof up there. That's a lot of roofing to put in dumpsters and to cart away and to pay for all of that. Carpentry is 35,000 on this bid. That's right. That's for the under, under the, the underneath the roof. No. I mean, from the inside. It's miscellaneous carpentry at the eave because there's a slope. There's a general slope at the eave that gets into your pitch that all that is going to be relined. For asphalt roofing, you have to line the entire roof. That's why that price is so high, because they cannot nail asphalt roof into concrete. OK, chimney repair, 16000 that would still be there? Chimney, that's our lowest cost on it. I don't like the price of the chimney repair, but it's part of that package. And then remove the antenna, it says 4,000. Sheet metal, 55,000. Yeah, that is the cornice that completely circles the, the cornice and the gutter and all your valleys. You have five domes up there, which is 10 valleys. Wow. And all the sheet metal completely around. I think I mentioned uh, how much of the sheet metal. Yes, 261 lineal feet of uh, cornice. The cornice is that liner you see completely around the building. That's an expensive item. And then the final one was the 75000 for the actual tiles. For the... Um, the tiles. Clay tiles. Clay tiles. Clay tiles. So, I mean, my question is, as I think maybe the others is, are all the costs, except for the clay tiles, going to be exactly the same or very similar if we were to go to asphalt, which apparently isn't cheaper anyway. I thought it would be. Would we incur all those other costs? Yes, you will still incur them to a certain degree. Give or take the contractor that you will hire to put up. You know, every contractor gives another bid in. I can't control the interpretation of the solicitation of the bid. The only, the only thing... <coughs> Just let me, let me talk about the, the Asheville tile a minute. And uh, I'll call it misinterpretation. Okay? Maybe on my part or whatever. But when those three bids came in, we were talking about an Asheville roof tile. And it come, the price was 80 some odd thousand dollars. I don't see how I could be expect not to believe that I was going to have a roof put on this village hall building for eighty thousand dollars that's the way i read the bid if i went out to bid or we accepted this board accepted that bid and then all of a sudden the contractor comes in and says oh wait a minute uh there's forty thousand dollars to remove the old roof 
there's twenty thousand dollars for this and there's twenty I would have been quite upset because I would have believed from the very beginning that when the bid went out for eighty thousand dollars that included all of that you know taking off the old roof putting the asphalt shingles on and what have you and for eighty thousand dollars I would have a roof up there of asphalt shingles now I'm hearing that no, what, let me correct something uh, I know yeah, what you were asking yeah no but you, you see what I was looking at when I when no, I says asphalt tile and I saw eighty thousand dollars I says wow you yeah. know in that eighty thousand dollars he has the removal that contractor who gave us that eighty thousand oh he, he did he have that in there. Okay. I'd like to make that uh, what he doesn't have in there is the pointing of the chimney which is in bad shape but that's maybe one of the minor things the cap wall the removal of the antenna and the copper corners and, uh, Alvin, the original thing was a proposal by a contractor. And that's another thing. thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Actual on plans and specifications. I understand that. Significant difference between <laughs> the the sheet metal work is fifty five thousand dollars. Is that that's that in replacement of the copper with copper? It's all the copper on that roof, including the 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 turning and the workmanship on the roof. That's correct. See, I mean, it seems to me. I mean, I. I I must say, Walter, I agree with you that I thought for 80,000. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Let's just say at 1040 on April the 8th, I mean, I thought for $80,000 we'd have a new roof, too. Um, so you did assume the same thing. Sure, I did. But, you know, I mean, I know that we talked about the cornice and the fact that it was kind of unknowable at the time that we first talked about this. But perhaps, you know, I mean, perhaps one thing to think about here. Uh, I mean, I think $254,000 is a lot of money to put into a roof on this building, uh, on this building. But, you know, perhaps the thing to think about is perhaps just putting uh, regular old gutters and leaders or something like that up there uh, and, and not, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I, I guess as the, the days and the dollars wear on, I feel less committed to, to the expensive job and more interested in saving some money. Of course, uh, we are. Well, we right. can issue buckets to all the departments. Over now, I don't want to issue <laughs> buckets, <laughs> but I'd like to do something that puts a, a, you know, a yeah. safe roof over everybody's head without putting a Cadillac up there, you know? It's, you're not putting a Cadillac. Let me, let me, this building was originally designed uh, 104 years ago. And somewhere, I don't know what uh, year or what month it was completed in 1876. But this building was designed as an institutional building. 1914. And that roof up there was designed for, specifically for clay tile. The roof is, an in, the gutter and the cornice is an integral part of the roof. You just can't slap another type of a gutter on there. That cornice is built in. We could show you details. It's on the drawings. How the cornice is an integral part of that. Also, it was an integral part of the soffit, which the village just spent a lot of money a couple of years ago in repairing the soffit because the soffit was falling and that was concrete. Now, you can't just suddenly say, I'm going to change the reconfiguration of all that copper up there, the cupola, the five domes, and that uh, cornice work. It's just not done that simply. You can't do it that simply. Now, the roof also, let me say something else. Clay <laughs> tile weighs about 900 pounds per square which is roughly 90 pounds per square foot. If you go onto your attic, you'll see that roof was built like a bomb shelter to hold up that kind of, of a roof. You can't just put a clay tile roof anywhere. This building was designed for that. To put an ash wall shingle there, you have to reconfigure your surfacing of your roof and that's why that price is so high, is because they would have to put three quarter inches of plywood up there to attach the shingles to it. So you have a lot of technicalities. We're dealing with a building and a structure that is, like in the city of New York, we have a lot of these problems. 
I'm working at the American Museum of Natural History, which buildings go back to 200 years. We have an old building on our hand. If I can give you a solution of putting up aluminum gutters, I'd be very happy to do that. I have a question about, you said you're not very happy with the $16,000 chimney repair. <coughs> Or, and I don't know how you feel about the 4,000 removal of the antenna. Are these things that we can take out of this bid and possibly uh, contract with someone else? I wouldn't recommend that we don't. The chimney is in bad shape. I have photographs of all this stuff. Because I realize you don't want to go up there and see it. I'm not questioning the fact that it needs repair. I'm questioning whether this company is the one that we should uh, allocate that repair to. If I, think, I think uh, if uh, with the, uh, Mr. Zachman, if we can get into a session, if we are going to be serious about this contractor, we'll call him in and discuss those problems. That can be done. We can kind of negotiate uh, the chimney repair and the antenna removal. The only problem with that is the probability <coughs> that if you're going to try to introduce another contractor to work in conjunction with this contractor, well, let me ask you something, Les. When you're talking about repairing the chimney, you're talking about just the chimney that's well, yeah, that's I'm visible. Just talking specifically the chimney, just, just the general. Concept. Just visible. No. Okay. No. Just the visible yeah. chimney. The chimney is in bad need of wood. No, well, the point I'm, I'm, I'm making is that you're not going below the roof. You're not. No, no, no. Just the part that's showing. That's true. Okay. What would it cost to put up a new chimney from that point on? <laughs> uh, it's a legitimate question. You tell me. A new chimney, $16,000? Suppose I wanted to just repair the chimney from, from, from the bottom of the roof on. What would it cost? Well, if we talk about a chimney, look at the size of that chimney up there. You have to put a scaffold up there. They have to completely scaffold that chimney. <laughs> and do the work that has to be the necessary work on it. Now, may I ask I you, if, if, if your recommendation is alternative one for one company, which is total removal and replacement of Spanish tile. Yeah. Now, on what, if, on what combination of factors did you base that? I mean, and, and was it a significant thing to you that it would last the 75 years? And, and the reason I ask this is because on the sheet with the nine alternatives, the lowest bid is from another company for a base bid, and that one is for a partial removal, salvage, and a replacement of the clay tile. But would that lesser bid of 202000 or 204000 I want to wear my glasses, um, would that also include the other things that this company has broken down for us, including mobilization, scaffolding, demolition, everything else would have been included in the $200,000 bill, but they would have tried to reuse the unbroken tiles, yes. and one side of the building wouldn't have been done, just the three That's sides. Correct. That's correct. The south side. Okay, so my, back to my first question. Then. What made you pick the 250 suggest to us? Well, the difference, uh, it, it's a matter of, uh, you know, all right, I know money is short, and every dime we can save is a dime saved. I understand that. But I'm looking at it in a long-term expenditure for the municipality. Right. What we're talking about is you can get a total new roof that a minimum of 75 years before you start repairing it. Okay, but if we were to go to the other one, which is partial removal. So then we're back maybe five years from now discussing that again. Why? Why? If three sides of the building are new. They're not new. No. They're not new. You're ripping off three sides, correct? No, no. Well, well, you're ripping off one section. Alan, I think, I think what Beth is saying, if we go to the three-quarter part, first, the, the base bit, right. and we don't repair the rear section, no. okay, what will the long-range potential be? And the long-range potential, I think, is that we will repair three-quarters of the roof. And that three-quarters may last 75 years, but that one part that do we do not repair five years down the road may be in so, such disrepair that we will have to then repair the other sector. And, and there's, there's, no, repair, there's no guarantee on that, right, Alan? There's no guarantee on that either, no. that portion. No. no, but I mean, I thought... Wasn't it just repair? That's right. I thought that was the reason we weren't going to do it. Within the, the last side. ten years, it I was done. It had been 
one side of this roof had been replaced. That's from a previous that is discussion. That is what we're talking yeah. about right now. Well, that was the rationale for the base bid, that it, we didn't have to do one each, side of the each, building because it had been done. Yeah, each right? contract, uh, you see, when we talk to these contractors, they all discouraged us from that whole thing. They could cooperated with us and gave us those figures. It was a big discouragement. It's a professional discouragement from contractors and saying, why are you going to patch repair it? The difference is maybe another $30,000 or $40,000. Lenny, I mean, okay. obviously we cannot bond this roof for 75 years. We can bond this roof for 20 years. Maybe. Most. Most. Could I ask you to give us, I mean, you know, the difference, the annual difference between 204 and 262 what can it be? It's pennies, 254. right? 254. You're going to make a comparison to 204 to 254. Oh, 254. I don't have my glasses on you. <laughs> 254 between two hours. So $50,000 um, in terms of, you know, bonding. You can't bond 100% of it, right? Or can you? What, what percent can you well, bond? Well, you have to make a 5% down payment. So uh, All right. So you bond 40, 40, let's say you bond $45,000. It's got to be pennies, right? Mm hmm Over 20 years, yeah. No, I mean, a year. I mean, I'm interested in, in, in you know, I just, yeah, I, each, I try to get the long term, years, 75 is beyond yeah. my scope. Well, that's the useful life in the That's uh, right. But I mean, in terms of the annual impact on taxes, be minimal. it's got to be <coughs> less than a, oh, no. small. Less than a buck a thousand, right? Mm hmm Pennies, a thousand. Pennies. <laughs> I mean, I think the thing that's so kind of distressing is that we thought that, I mean, and maybe this is true of everything we do, Alan, but we thought uh, that it was going to be a lot cheaper. And it's, it's somewhat breathtaking to find out what the bids have actually come in at. Particularly it's a difficult since project. And I was, I think we had, what, 11 people who picked up bids? 11. Now, we all know that there are people out of work, contractors are out of work. We had 11 people pick up the bids and three responded. So, but nine people walked away. Let, let me ask you another question because uh, we did discuss the last time when we were over in the Emlyn some of the members was on, uh, sometime in the summer, that one of the difficulties that, e that you expressed to us was that the insurance requirements were perhaps too, uh, too uh, uh, strict or too difficult for many contractors to meet. And so one of the rationales for going out to bid again is that we would relax or lower uh, my memory is a little hazy, but the, I think the general liability or, you know, what some insurance requirement on this particular bonding. job. What was it? The yeah, bonding, the bonding requirement. Mm -hmm. And is, is that what this last column deals with here? I mean, would you like to address that issue? Well, that's oh, oh, now I will put on my glasses. Uh, uh, alternative three, 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 deduct for lower insurance. I mean, what, what, could you just talk about that for a second? Lower from what to what? Five mil to three? Five million to three million. For the bond. That, that was what That the, seems incredibly low. The $500. I mean, the differential yes. between those two insurance amounts. 250 in one instance and five in the other. We asked, I mean, we asked people to go to bid on two bases. Is that what this is, or just to show us, just to show us what the deduct would be? What the deduct that we went from five? From to five to three, three. and it was this no, little de minimus amount. Yes. It's not Our insurance consultant indicate, had indicated to us that he didn't think it would be a significant uh -huh. amount. But we had felt, I think you had felt, Alan, that that lowering it would bring forward more people to bid on the job. Yes. They did. They took it, but they didn't come bring they it back. They took it, but they didn't want to put these nice. So this is the bid bidding. Did, did we get any feedback from people as to why they hadn't bid on the job? Yes, I, I called a couple of them because I was disappointed in the return. 
And? And they just said that the job is a complicated job, but we don't want it. The normalization of the job is why we're paying that price. Now, let, me, let me ask you a question because I think we talked about it once before and that is getting the right people. I think you brought it up to do a tile job. Yes. How would we get the right... You're, you're, fortunately, the three bidders are the right people. Okay, yes. yes. Either one. The three of them are excellent, yes. Good. And I think the, that demonstrates that the big guys can do this kind of a job and those three that responded I was a little surprised that Barrett Mount Perel came in the lowest because I guess they need work. No, it wasn't it wasn't the lowest by a lot. For the total the alternative yeah, bid the was total. just eight thousand. But in, um, on the um, how is there a time frame within within the bid that went out that was suggested in which it it could or should be done? All right, what was it? I just well, I think uh, we, we required in the bid documents that each contractor submit with their bid <coughs> how much time it would take. Right. And uh, two of them indicated uh, 120 days. 120 days. From the start. One okay. indicated, I believe it was a Petri that said 240 days. 240 from Petri. Yes. Petri was the low bid of uh, the, the base bid. And but he also indicated that it would take him 240 days okay. to complete the job, okay. whereas the other two uh, indicated 120 days. All right, and is there any way, if we were to pick anything to do, that within the contract we could have an incentive if they finish early and the penalty if they finish late? I mean, in other words, that some of the costs would drop in any way? Uh, well, this is a you know a subject that's been bandied around in, in, yeah. in the courts for a good, a good many years now relative to the question of uh, liquidated damages and penalties and, and the question of if you have penalties, you also have to have incentives, and it's and it's an extremely. I'm sure that Jim can tell you it's a it's a it's a very sensitive area. Is that a no? Well, we say no. discussed it maybe even yeah. with respect to this <coughs> project, but we discussed it before at board meetings, <coughs> where the issue was um, do we build in a penalty for late completion, to which they will automatically respond when we get a premium for early completion. And I don't know how, from the standpoint of cost savings, we're going to benefit from that. Thanks. Okay. Let me ask just one more question. Uh, first of all, do you have any ex personal experience with the work of this non or whatever they call themselves? I've had experience with all three of them. non Nonparal. I thought it was some chocolates with little white things on them. <laughs> <laughs> all three. Well, they're from <laughs> Connecticut. <laughs> And I've never known how to say it. They're from Connecticut. Yeah. Um, yes. And you know their work? Uh, experience with all three of them. Uh, um, Petrie in New York City, uh, BB at, and also in Yes. And you're, and you're, I mean, the fact that their names are here on a report with your name <laughs> that means that you think they're satisfactory. I people. would recommend that all three of them. Okay. Of course, here again, and I also would say that what we you're, you're not going to be liable, you know, if they don't well, do a good job. But if you know okay. their work, it certainly is uh, worth something to throw in. Okay, let me just say this: part of our basic contract with uh, with Alan, Alan's firm, was that, uh, and 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 part of the verbiage in the bid documents was that we very specifically said that don't bid this job to any contractor. You don't have the experience to do it. Then. Yeah. And that our contract agreement with Alan was once the bids did come in, he would evaluate these. And if, in fact, any of these did not have the credentials, they wouldn't even be on the, on the recommendations. So they wouldn't have gotten past the stage of even, even being presented as a, as a viable possibility. Let me ask one more question, because it's an idea I've never been able to quite let loose of. Is there any way, as we go forward with this thing, to open up any dormers up there at all? Any, any dormers to, to make door? that space on the third on the in the attic more usable? You just now added another twenty thousand dollars. <laughs> well, no, I mean, part of that. we're adding money, but twenty thousand dollars isn't all that bad. Alan, if you started, but if you started the process immediately. Would we get out of the bad weather by the time this roof is finished? Or, you know? We've been enjoying great weather. In fact, I'm sorry we didn't start a couple of months ago. Yeah. 
I, uh, that would be your, you know. Yeah, now is the time day. to do it, Wolf, normally. Yeah. Even we've had a very unusual winter. I believe it's a record winter since 1931. Okay, put that aside. This is the normal time when roofing job should be done. Now, another thing I would suggest, and I would talk to uh, Les, is that if the village is going ahead with this job, is to call in non Corral and discuss negotiating that, you know, tell them we're not happy with the chimney and uh, the antenna removal. I, I, would, I would suggest before we say that that's a viable alternative, I would have to discuss, we would have to discuss it with Jim to make sure that this is not something that will compromise some of the other things. You have to award the bid. You have to award the bid and then try it. Twenty thousand a dormer. Oh, I'm only kidding about that. <laughs> no. Let me look at. It. I'm interested in dormers up there because that's wonderful space, and uh, you know. Well, I'll tell well, you. It's potentially wonderful space. <laughs> the thing that discourages me about your idea is this. Yeah, I've mentioned it before. The roof was designed to hold roof. ninety pounds per square foot. The concrete up there is about six inches thick. <laughs> And it would be costly, and of course here again you're, you're asking me about something that I haven't looked at. I have been up there, I've looked at it a lot uh, when we first started this process last year, and I know that it's concrete. But it seems like, uh, I mean, to the extent that we're suffering from some space problems in the building itself, and that it's just dead storage up there, that if we could use it, uh, and, you know, or if we could fix it, at relatively reasonable cost, whatever that means, might be something we should do. Okay. One, of, one of the things that we talked about originally was when we were talking about the possibility of opening up the existing room is the lack of definitive information that we have with the existing room. That's right. And I That's believe right. the expression I used was we would be opening up Pandora's box. And $20,000 may turn out to be a humongously exp larger expenditure. And once you start it, you just don't say, oh, I can change my mind. Once you open it up, the, 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 the domino effect is, is there, and you can't stop it. So another thing is you have five of those dormers in a cupola up there. This is also adding to the expense for a roofer to work around the intricacies of that architecture. You see, each of these things have to be done correctly if you take a good look at the, at these dormers. Had that roof perhaps been a straight gable roof without all that architecture up there, I'm sure the roof would have come down in cost. It's all those little intricacies of the gutter work and the copper work that has to be done up there. Okay. Thank you, Alan Gary. Appreciate your work. Uh, motion to award the bid to Barrett non Perel, 254. Somebody? Well, does this have the boy thing sitting there? Are you comfortable with it? It seems like an awful I mean, let me, th I'm sorry. I know it's late and you want to go. Well, that's all right. Unless <laughs> <laughs> you'll see me, catch me now. Don't <laughs> say oh, that. Come on. We may reject <laughs> these bids and do it again. I mean, you know. This is just a what if, and I don't mean this to be a blasphemous thought, but what if the dormers were closed in? Another idea, all right? And we just made a straight roof out of it. Any ideas? I mean, well, would, we, would we cut the, let's say, would we cut it in half? Oh, I don't think so. I think you're adding more expense. We're adding demolition expense, and I'm only talking intuitively now. And, uh, we're stuck with what we got, is that what you're saying? I, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's wonderful, on the other hand, if you told me that, you know, it would be $120,000 if we just put a straight tile roof up there. <laughs> I, I would consider it. You know, I only write the prescription. <laughs> I don't, I'm not the contractor. And why contractors deviate and go their way, or why, I cannot explain that to you. Right. I have an idea of knowing what the cost of the material is. You know? But you've got to understand, you know, you're buying a roof 
with a 50-year guarantee, you'll probably get before you get your first repair within 75 years. And what you have up there attests to that. It's 104 years. The majority of it has been there. Yeah, but you know, I mean, since we're into this dialogue, the fact of the matter is, is that this building is not particularly appropriate to the, to the use that it's currently being put to. And it doesn't particularly speak to me that we're going to put a 75-year roof on, on a building that is, even today, not meeting the needs that uh, it should. Now, I mean, I'm not saying that we're going to fix Village Hall next year or move next year. But the point, Kate, is that regardless of what we do or don't do, that's the only roof that we're hearing first. that can be put up there, basically. I mean, we now had to eliminate an no. asphalt roof. No, no, no. no? no. <laughs> I thought you said the asphalt roof. I you should not recommend that. If, that. You, if you are going to move, which I have been a number of years ago involved in a study on, right on the roof. Good one. had the village gone ahead and gotten rid of this piece of property, within, say, next 10 or 15 years, I would say, yes, let's put an asphalt roof up. But I, as far as I'm concerned, I don't see you people leaving here for the next 100 years. <laughs> the people will let you. That's the way it seems today, you know. <laughs> so in that aspect, if you're going to stay here for the rest of our lives, you may as well spend the money that's going to be the duration of the building. But yes, if we were going to move from this building 10 years from now, I'd say put the asphalt roof up there. Spend the $88,000. Don't fix certain aspects. Don't leave that antenna there. Maybe it'll fall, maybe it won't. <laughs> oh, but the 88 wasn't going to cover the, the, the 55 uh, or whatever. But we're, we're not going to move, are we? No, no, no. no. I, I, you know, I mean, probably not in my tenure. It took us a long time to get here. You think we're going to move in the, in the course of less than five or ten years of discussion? One last question. And that is, after the new roof is put on, if you wanted to add another building or a structure to this one, that roof would be in no way affected by that, right? Suppose you wanted to add on an addition here, well, 10 or 15 years. Yeah, well, just like this addition, it was added on in 1961. Yeah. It didn't interfere with that. Okay, so we have no... And if I believe your last uh, study, there was the suggestion... Was it the east side? Yeah. And sure, you just keep the building below your, um, your eaves. See? Start. Oh, no. Okay. And if you hire me, I'll design it so it definitely won't touch my roof. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Motion for Barrett non Ferrile, 254. Yeah, well, you did a wonderful job. We, thank we, you. We, we need a roof. And, Thanks for putting uh, up with us. And it looks like this is the only way to go, so uh, I'll make the motion. Second. I'll second. Trust the officer. Based on Ellen's work, the advice of the village engineer, I will vote yes to proceed with awarding this bid and hope that we can negotiate uh, some smaller amount, because it is a large amount, but I do agree we need a roof. Trustee Weingarten? Thank you for your patience, Ellen. I vote yes. Rogers? Yes. Hofstetter? Yes. Mayor Noto? Yes. Seconded. Okay, minutes, November 13th, 1990. Madam Mayor, I will put a I will put a bond resolution on yes. for the next yes. And wait, well, on this on the roof? What? Oh wait, and uh, before you came in, Lenny, we moved the. Uh, I know. Okay. Yes, yeah. yeah, so on the minutes. Well, last, you want to make a comment? I just wanted to publicly thank uh, the uh, members of the board for the uh, moment of silence that was observed uh, at the time of my brother's death. You're welcome. Uh, any additions or corrections for the minutes? No. No? Or oh, Jim? Correction, yeah, on page 16. 16? Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is the village attorney asked if Mr. McCaffrey is aware of any local law, uh, that should be any local law in another community that might have the provision. Uh, mm -hmm. I was wondering if we were talking about seeing what other communities have done about the, these types of conflicts. Mm -hmm. I also refer to him being aware of local law within our community, but within another community, so I think that should be changed. 
Any other additions or corrections? Motion to approve. So moved. Second. Yes, sir. Trustee Ottinger? Yes. Weingarten? Yes. Rogers? Yes. Hofstetter? Yes. Mayor Noto? Yes. Okay, uh, yeah, the traffic commission is recommending a handicapped space. Um, there. What? what about the oh, I'm abstract. sorry, the abstract. Yes. Forgive me. The abstract. Oh. He's got buried here in all my budget stuff. Comments or questions on the abstract? Okay. Move to pay. Second. Second. Trustee Ottinger? Yes. Weingarten? Yes. Rogers? Yes. Hofstetter? Yes. Okay, request for handicapped parking on a non metered spot between the corner of Mount Pleasant and the beginning of the St. Thomas parking lot. It's not for anybody, it's for anyone who's handicapped. handicapped parking space. Has requested it, but there's no guarantee she'll get it. But there is no handicapped parking on that side, I have Mayor, to say. Mayor, just on this. Non metered? Non metered. Non -metered. There are no meters there. We're not putting meters in. I mean, there are no meters there now. Going north, going south after the driveway. And west of St. Thomas's driveway. That that section between Mount Pleasant Corner and St. Thomas's. Yeah. And that's, and that's far, you know, what is it, 90 minutes? No, it's one, 60 minutes. 60 minutes. Okay. I and mean, that's all it is. We're not changing that either. Okay. No, it's the same. That does not remove fines. No. 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 Anybody who parks is subject to the, and, and tomorrow, this police department is going to go crazy. And I'm going to get so many phone calls, it's not going to be funny. <laughs> uh, my phone lines are going to be burning tomorrow afternoon, right, Chief? Thanks. I know. You may run the with these people. I know. All right, Lenny, you wanted to say yes, something? Yes, Lenny. May I this request? I meant to check with the village attorney, but I think we need a resolution from the traffic commission to implement this. Yeah, we had discussed that earlier. Yeah. I thought you would already uh, arrange for that to be submitted. Is that, is that being done? So, well, so we'll table it. So tell them that we're going to table Gone. Okay, um, request to attend New York State Building Officials Conference from the Building Department. $420 each, uh, already in this year's budget. Motion to approve. So move. Oh, wait a second. I didn't see the fire inspectors going to. <laughs> you taking that quarter of a million dollar boat with you, or this is this is a land trip? Okay. okay. So move. Well, it's in Rochester, so that's not going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. My brother. Yes, I have. My brother went to the University of Rochester. So. All right. Is there a second? I'd never go there myself. Trustee Ottinger? They should pay you $420 to go up there. Are you kidding? Okay. Yes. Weinbarton? Five as many. Rogers? Yes. Hofstetter? Yes. Mayor Noto? Yes. Communication for the fire department. Tom Burke is the new chief. Lawrence J. Regano is the new first assistant chief. And Lawrence Citrone, who didn't want to stick around for the rest of the meeting, is the new baby chief. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yes. Oh, come on. This was this was peanuts. Well, I heard it was a $50,000 difference, and, you know, that's going to be no problem. I want to make sure that First of all, this is a capital expense, and so yes, and if whatever has to be done for you will be a capital expense. We'll find the money. Okay, file for the record the CSCA agreement, so noted. Finally signed. It's finally signed. Good. Okay. Is that one of your last official acts? That was one of my last official okay. acts. On <laughs> All right, three re a resolution abolishing three uh, uh, relatively defunct uh, committees, Sewer Task Force, Rhinex Safety Task Force, and Volunteer Rescue Squad Transition Committee. Motion, please. So Second. Second. Trustee Ottinger? Yes. Weingart? Yes. Rogers? Yes. Hofstetter? Yes, and we've received from the chief his uh, monthly report for February. Chief, I noticed that the parking fines are a little low. What's going on? <laughs> 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 we only got $16,000 well, this month. Don't keep it up, Joe. Right. So we, we can, uh, can't, get my, 
Yeah, yeah. Now I wanted to ask you about that. I got your memo. Okay. And the problem is we don't have a bill or even a bill number. So no, it's we kind don't. Can you? Do you need this tonight? I mean, can we wait till the next board meeting? No, no. I thought that, that I discussed it with Lenny, and he said that maybe if we just got the resolution to sort of to back this, because you know, definitely we need it. Concept. Yeah. That uh, huh? you know the concept of what's going on. Right. Then okay. you could always word it with uh, Jimmy or something and get it to the right people. And on the auxiliary, then this will amend the CPL. So that the special police, there will be special police constables then. Right. Right. No longer will there be auxiliary no, police. Be okay. Which we have supported. All right. Um, all right. So you want a resolution supporting uh, state legislation that would permit the appointment of special police constables by towns and villages. Right. Okay. Someone want to move that? Move the resolution. Second. Yeah. Somebody want to second it? I'm just reading it. Okay. I just picked it up. I'll second this. Okay. This is what is going to basically allow them, the, right now it's only the county that can appoint the auxiliaries and, and train them, not the communities, and this would allow... Well, there's two questions there, I think, Chief. One is um, when they can, what they can do yes. when they are called out to act. Uh, that's one of the issues. And the other is what control we have over them and who calls them out. Uh, now the way it stands is the county, and they can only assist with, with certain limited functions. But I understand this um, legislation, which I haven't read, but I've heard of, is basically to enable us to um, determine when they are utilized and, and affect the, and to what extent they'll assist the local police. They're not going to be limited, for example, to just uh, traffic functions, well, for special events, or for disaster control. Okay, with all due respect, I don't think I'd have a problem with that, but I would like to see it instead of voting on a, on a something that we don't have. Because well, you say in here you believe it deals with it, and yet we're, we make well, our case well, and we don't I know. I have it written right out here, and if, if I could just okh briefly read it to you, uh, could I do that? Yeah, sure. And okay. the whole, is it long? No, no, oh. it's not long. <laughs> no, I'll just, I'll just give you the highlights, okay? Um, so, uh, to, uh, constables or police special constable of a town or a village, provided such designation is not inconsistent with local law, and now the new part is, and provided further, that in the case of special constables, Nothing in this subdivision shall be deemed to authorize such officers to carry, possess, repair, or dispose of a firearm unless the appropriate license therefore has been issued pursuant to section 400 of the penal law and provided further that such an officer shall have the powers set forth in section 2.20 of this article only when duly assigned to perform his or her special duties by the chief police official of the town or village. Subsequently, what we're doing here is we do conform to both of these sections right now. So that, you know, that's no problem. And then the last part says that uh, special constables shall, shall be subject to the authority and direction of the chief police official of the village police department. The chief police official may, from time to time, and subject to the prior approval of the Board of Trustees, assign such special constables to assist the police department to direct and control traffic, to assist the police department in crowd control, in crowd control and or to patrol public lands and buildings. And if it gets passed, it says this act shall take effect immediately. Um, okay, that sounds like we that, that's, that covers what, in other words, what we're doing is we're taking our same auxiliary police who are trained and properly licensed. And what we will do is call them special constables, but will be completely under our control, of which we budget for them anyway. Right. And we take their liability as it is now. So what we're simply doing is that the state now is saying that we can have the authority now to do this. And uh, and only the state can say that. We'll be, uh, we'll be doing basically what we did before with the OGS. In other words, we'll, do, we'll be doing basically what we did before, except they will be under our control, right. and the county will no longer be responsible 
which I understand. It never bothered us anyway, really. Okay, okay. 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 So it's, uh, it's been seconded, so we can vote. Trustee Ottinger? Yes. Weingarten? Yes. Rogers? Yes. Hofstetter? Yes. Mayor Norris? Yes. Thank you, Chief. Okay, now we have to do... Uh, I'd like to set up another uh, budget work session, well, the first budget work session, for Wednesday night. Uh, we can invite the budget committee. It's, you know, we have to start making some decisions, so I think... Uh, yeah, could, I, could I specifically ask? That's fine with me, Wednesday Yeah, let's we'll see if there's a place. Is this one available on here? We'll have to check the... Uh, yeah, otherwise, we go... We can go to the light traffic. Be careful we want to go to the library. It's open seven days a week, every day. Yeah, they're going to charge you 25 bucks an hour. What time would you be meeting? 8 o'clock. Traffic commission right? We can meet up, with the public session, we can meet upstairs, or we can meet in the library, or we can meet the... Well, why can't the traffic commission meet upstairs and let us have this? Well, they need, they have to have hearings. But they can't have to. They can't have many people, so I think we take a little priority. Yeah, we do. I mean, we need to have a public space. CCM meets, but it doesn't say that. Oh, CCM. I think CCM's at the library. It's not. This one. Oh, this one. Oh, it is. This one's there. Yeah, you know, so we're up next week. Traffic commission. All right, anyway, somewhere. We'll let you know where. All right. Can I ask that 8 p.m.? Each of us. 8 p.m.? Yeah, 8 o'clock. Each of us review the stuff that's been coming from the budget committee in terms of looking at revenue enhancing items. Yes. Yes, let's make some preliminary, some decisions. Anyway. Well, I mean, that's something we really haven't talked about very sure. much. Uh, yeah. But I think that that's something that we could, we could probably spend some time looking at. Okay. And before the month is out, several of the commissions have been meeting really to be constituted so that they also should get the same direction as the others have previously to look at some of the fees and we just get there and have them discuss it too and have their own Yeah, I, I think, you know, Lenny, I, I think you and I have talked about, uh, we, we got a letter from the Parks and Rec Commission saying they were against, quote, closing the beach, but I, I hope that in the discussions in the last few uh, public meetings here, people understand that we're not talking about, quote, closing the beach, but that we are talking about alternatives. And, I'd like the uh, Parks and Rec Commission to look at those fees and tennis fee recommendations and also there have been some daycare or uh, some day camp recommendations and I think those things should be discussed uh, by the Parks and Rec Commission. And I also think the Harbor Commission should be involved with any increase in... Uh, yeah, I don't think you'll get it all by the end of the month though. Well, well they're both meeting this month and at least... Uh, yeah. And Jim has already been asked to look at the uh, his his fees or his yeah. cost of servicing the the mooring yeah. so that we can make right. that. Uh, we need a brief executive session. May I also yeah. say that I think we all received an, uh, something from the FTA. Yes, yes, we got the RFP. And we uh, have to discuss uh, right. that. And so well, I'm going to see if we get more time because I, you know, I this is a bad month to talk about. So we'll, we'll, I'm sure I'll give us more time to comment. Okay. Yeah. Or we'll ask them. Because I drag on. If, we have to, if, we, if they don't, we have to discuss it. Yeah, and I shipped it off to planning and Frank Fish and everybody else for their comments. So uh, it's, it's, it's okay except for the parking, which is always been thinking. All right, uh, brief executive session to talk about personnel, please. Uh, need you. Well, <laughs> Welcome to Larchmont Mariner Community News. I'm Roger Norum. And I'm Bill Littower. Here are some of our top stories this week. Budget cuts in the village of Mamaroneck. Should funds be cut for the Emlyn Theater, the Harbor Island Beach, or the library? Will the Hummock swimming pool be ready when the real summer weather hits? A cruise ship sails into Mamaroneck Harbor. A candidate to be a presidential scholar in our area. You'll meet her in a moment. But first, the latest on the Hummock's pool. Here's LMC reporter Sven Ohm. Last week's warm weather spell may have made you yearn for a dip in the pool. As we reported earlier, the Hammocks pool in Mimaranek is closed for repairs of tiles and doors. In late February, a contract had been awarded to Atlantic Contracting Corporation to start work on March 1st. All work is planned to be completed by July 1st. 
As April 1st passed without any action at the pool, people are starting to wonder if we will be able to use it this summer. The firm has said that the work will be finished on time. The firm also has another project in our neighborhood. Atlantic Contracting is also rebuilding Rye Golf Club's pool and clubhouse. Let's hope that that major project does not keep us out of the Homex pool this summer. Swimming also has to do with our next story. It's budget season in Mimaranek. Three programs are facing cutbacks. The Emlyn Theatre, the Mimaranek Free Library, the Stephen Johnston Beach at Harbour Island. The cuts would mean no more swimming at the beach as lifeguard jobs will be eliminated. Cuts proposed at the Emlyn would just amount to $20,000. But the cutback could send a discouraging message to other agencies that fund the theater. It's going to cost some two million dollars to build, but it should improve the garbage collection and disposal problem for Larchmont and Mamaroneck Town. It's the new Maxwell Avenue transfer station in the town of Mamaroneck. It has taken more than five years of negotiations with the county, but it appears a formal agreement is near on modernization of the facility. Construction could begin in a year and a half, when complete, the station would handle three trucks at a time in an enclosed facility, moving 20 to 24,000 tons of garbage a year from Larchmont and Mamaroneck Town to the Charles Point Resource Recovery Plant in Peekskill. The village of Larchmont police and fire budgets are rising this year despite attempts to hold down spending. The higher spending will go almost entirely for union pay hikes. Higher salaries account for more than $154,000 in increased spending under the proposed 1991-92 budget. This past week, one of the largest boats to ever grace Mamaroneck Harbor paid a visit to pick up some people for a party. The company called Custom Cruises, based in Mamaroneck, was hosting a party on one of its own boats, the Spirit of New Jersey. Marshmont Mamaroneck Community News spoke with the president of the firm. What brings the Spirit of New Jersey? It's the biggest boat I've seen ever in uh, Mamaroneck Harbor. What brings it to uh, Mamaroneck? We're having a, an anniversary cruise this evening to celebrate Custom Cruises' fifth anniversary. We'll have 275 guests this evening. The yacht uh, sails with 350 ordinarily. We're going to stay in the Long Island Sound, head towards the Drugs Neck Bridge for a little bit of uh, lights and fun. We'll serve dinner. We have entertainment on board. Can anybody rent this boat? Yes, they can. The Mamaroneck train station has long been the subject of discussion what to do with the second oldest station on the New Haven line. In recent years, the Metropolitan Transit Authority has asked for proposals but rejected developer plans for the station. Now the MTA is trying again with the idea in mind that a developer might construct 160 residential units or possibly a commercial development in that same league. The Mamaroneck Village Board is considering plans for the station and is asking for ideas. Is. Let the mayor or any of the trustees have your thoughts on the subject. A touch of the White House in our area, academically speaking. For more, here's our Larchmont Mamaroneck School News reporter, Monique Citron, with a special interview. What would you say to Thornton Wilder if you had a chance? Jessica Lissy, Mamaroneck senior, just had a chance and it made her a presidential scholar finalist. <laughs> Jessica, tell us about your adventure. Well, I went to visit him at his house and he offered me muffins and tea and we discussed the theater. Um, Thornton Wilder's ideas about the theater are that it's, it's something very basic that puts human beings in touch with their own humanity. Um, and so a lot of his plays dealt with not having any scenery and that's something that's always really excited me. I should explain that this was on an essay you wrote to become a president of yes. Scarlet I <laughs> didn't actually meet with Thornton Wilder. But um, his plays touch you and that was through your involvement with Pace. Mm -hmm. And you've been involved with Pace your entire time at My entire high school career. For and four what, have years. You, what have you been doing with that? Um, well, a lot of things. Uh, everything from dancing to choreographing to I wrote two plays and assistant directed them. And I also had to build the sets and design the sets and the lighting for those two shows. Um, I've done publicity. I've, I've acted. I've directed. I've you really have done uh, the gamut. Yes, I've become a well-rounded. Thought you would have been proud of you. <laughs> I hope so. Um, and so. All of this went into the Presidential Scholar um, 
competition and mm -hmm. what else what else did you do for it and what will it mean if you win? Well, there's this very long application with several essay questions about lots of everything from my academic abilities to leadership to community service to artistic. And there are only 500 in the whole country, I understand. Well, it started off, they chose 1,500 uh, high school seniors from test scores, SATs and stuff. Um, and then I made the first cut, so now I'm one of 500 finalists. And eventually they'll choose about 121 kids, two from each state and a few extras. And next week, um, one other thought is, is kinesthesia. Mm -hmm. What is that, and, and, and what? And it's next. It's this coming. It's Thursday this week. It's Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Oh, I see. At eight o'clock in the Pace Center, which is in the Post Road building on the third floor. Um, it's an evening of, of dance, uh, choreographed by various students in the high school, juniors and seniors. We're all invited to come. You're all invited to come, and uh, from the dances that I've seen, it looks like a very exciting, creative event. Thank you, Jessica, and come see kinesthesia, and congratulations. Thank you. Very much. Chatsworth Avenue's sixth grader has qualified for the finals of the New York State Geography Bee. Arthur Harris has a shot at winning a $25,000 scholarship if he makes it to the National Geography Bee. A naturalist course is being offered next Wednesday, April 24th, at the Larchmont Reservoir Conservancy. The course is to train people to work with area youth at local beaches or at the reservoir. Allison Bial of the Marshlands Conservancy is giving the naturalist course. It runs from 9.30 in the morning until noon, Wednesday, April 24th. No science background is needed, and if you want more information, call 381-0450. That's 381-0450. No doubt about it, Larchmont is a bona fide tree city. For the 10th consecutive year, the National Arbor Day Foundation has designated Larchmont a tree city. The presentation of the award will be made during Arbor Day ceremonies later this month. Larchmont will then get its own tree city USA flag. And the good spring weather has brought us into another season of restaurant reviews by the Larchmont Mariner Community News Reporter assigned the most difficult task of this program. Anyone who's ever been near Larchmont train station knows the restaurant we're speaking of this time. Sonny will tell us about it. Hi, Sonny Goldberg here at Carl's Restaurant um, reporting for Channel 36 News. And I'm sitting with Bill Dratty, who is one of the owners of this uh, restaurant, which has been a tradition here for a long time. Uh, but I understand Carl's is kind of under new management for the last couple of years? Well, we've had it now for uh, starting our fourth year. But we couldn't really call it new anyway, because... No, uh, I've known Carl's uh, since the... Uh, uh, early 60s. Right. I came here as a customer. Now, Bill, you also own Gus's. Gus's in Harrison, which is a, a landmark uh, restaurant in Harrison. Absolutely, and the salads are the same, and uh, exactly the, the same. fish and the wonderful, all the items are the right. same as in both uh, spots, correct? Right. We bought the two places within uh, six months of each other. Carl, Gus's first, and then Carl's. And your specialties here are? Well, I, I'd say the steak uh, part of the menu is very important in Carl's, where in Gus's to reverse the uh, lobsters and the seafood, the broiled seafood is what we specialize in there. Uh, Kevin, our chef here, uh, of course, makes many specials, veal specials. Uh. Well, sitting in front of me smells something that is so divine, the shrimp and uh, black pepper fettuccine, and your uh, fish looks absolutely beautiful. Well, that's black and swordfish with a guacamole sauce and uh, roasted potatoes. Gorgeous. An excellent seller here. Now, you all are open for lunch and dinner. And dinner, seven days a week. Fantastic, and you're located right across from the train station so you could even walk, right? Right, and you have a beautiful park outside. And you have a beautiful park outside. Well, I know this is a difficult thing, but I've got to take a... Uh, That's uh, uh, black pepper fettuccine. You describe it while I... Uh, black pepper fettuccine. Yeah. With a, uh, with a special sauce that Kevin makes uh, uh, with some nice broiled shrimp on top. Uh, he has a special sausage in there that he uses mm. with the shrimp. And it's it's one of his specialties, uh, a big seller for us. Fantastic. Well, uh, as you can tell, as it t as a way it tastes. It's wonderful. It's tangy. You'll it's be back tangy. tomorrow. Absolutely, I want the same thing. <laughs> you all want to taste this divine dish? Come over to Carl's seven days a week. And uh, thank you, Bill, for sitting with us. Look for his face. He also has a couple of other partners. Uh, uh, yeah, well, Paul Cunningham. Paul Cunningham, who's a little camera shy. <laughs> and Ed O'Reilly. And Ed O'Reilly. Jim Murray. Jim Murray. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And um, it's a tough job but somebody's got to do it again. So back to you at the studio. 
Okay. And that's it for another edition of Larchmont Mamarina Community News. Remember, this program is repeated every weekday night at 7.30 and 12.30. A new news show is presented every Monday night. So if you missed any portion of the program, catch us during one of the 7.30 or 12.30 repeats. And if you'd like to stop by and take a look at how we put the program together, drop by any Thursday night in the Palmer Avenue side of Mamaroneck High School in the Channel 36 studios. We'd love to see you and show you around. Thanks for watching Large Mop America Community News. I'm Roger Norum. And I'm Bill Littower. We'll see you next week at the same time.